Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the City Council Chambers. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson of the 16th District of the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. I want to welcome each and every one of you to our hearing this morning, and certainly to all of my colleagues who are here and those who will be joining us. I thank you for coming to today's hearing. This morning, we are examining the NYPD school safety's role and efforts to improve school climate. The safety of our students, 1.1 million students that are in our New York City public schools is of paramount importance to everyone and we depend and rely on our school safety agents to play a very critical role in ensuring the security of our students, parents, educators and administrators. It is truly essential that we strike a very delicate but necessary balance between education and public safety. We need a cultural shift to ensure that our schools are a pipeline to success and not a pipeline to prison, but rather college and careers. We must focus our energies on creative approaches in education and providing sufficient resources to better enable the prevention and the de-escalation of problem situations before they get out of hand. Truly, prevention is key and not reactions after situations occur. I want to recognize and applaud our Mayor Bill de Blasio and our school's Chancellor Carmen Farina for their recent announcement of an $8 million plan to prevent bullying in our schools. This plan would include an online portal where families can report any instances of bullying, harassment, and or discrimination. Both the Department of Ed and the NYPD School Safety Division work hand in hand together to maintain and strengthen safe and supportive learning environments for all of our students. To that end, the NYPD School Safety Division instituted recently a warning card system. Through this system, the SSA officer issues a warning card for certain low-level offenses in lieu of a criminal court summons, and the issue is then handled administratively by that particular school. This system was initially piloted in several schools in the Bronx and now is being expanded to additional schools throughout the city. I am interested this morning in learning more about this program and certainly any limitations or challenges that we are currently facing and certainly any improvements and ways that we can continue to roll the warning card system further. In addition, I'd also like to learn about Team Up Tuesdays, which are programs in which officers from our local precincts lead students from grades K through 12 in activities that are focused on teamwork, partnership, and leadership. I'd also like to learn about the status of the SSA's enhanced de-escalation training. Both the Department of Ed and School Safety Division play a very important role in keeping our students and educators in a safe, supportive, and secure learning environment, and I truly want to commend the School Safety Division for their efforts. Certainly, over the past four years in serving as chair of this Committee on Public Safety, it's truly been a blessing and an honor to work very closely with school safety agents. You are the front line to keeping our children safe. You are the first point of entry for every New York City public school, and we truly know that we cannot do this work without you. I appreciate that during this administration, we have recognized that every stakeholder has a role to play. And that's why in 2015, the mayor and the chancellor announced the formation of the school leadership climate team to bring school safety agents, the Department of Education, the mayor's office of criminal justice, parents, advocates, civil rights organizations, and everyone who truly has a fundamental passion for keeping our children safe and brought us together. And even now, over two years later, the school leadership climate team continues to meet, continues to dialogue, and talk about ways in which we can continue to work together. 
I don't think I have ever in my tenure as an elected official seen this level of partnership. And so I certainly, publicly and privately, you know that I've always been a supporter and an advocate with school safety. Want to commend each and every one of you. As I travel in my district, School District 9, School District 8, and School District 12 in the Bronx, I really have an opportunity to get to know many of our school safety agents. Um, and I see the work they do. Many of the school safety agents in the district I represent are predominantly women and women of color who have a long tenure with the department and I appreciate their compassion and their commitment every single day. So I'm looking forward to today's hearing. Uh, certainly I know that the Committee on Education has had a recent hearing in October as it relates specifically to bullying in our schools. And today's hearing is really an opportunity to hear from school safety, to make sure that you have an opportunity to go on record and talk about the role you play in school climate, um, where you see the chancellor's announcement of bullying programs and resources, where you fall in line with that. And certainly moving forward into the new year, um, I will be serving for another term of four years. And so my commitment, whether I chair public safety or not, is always there. So I certainly want to hear moving forward into a new year uh, where we can continue to partner and work together. So I thank you for joining us today. I thank my colleagues for being here. Uh, Council Member Richie Torres is here and Council Member Rory Lansman are with us as well. And I want to acknowledge and thank the staff of the Committee on Public Safety for their work today in getting our hearing together. Our Senior Legislative Counsel, Deepa Ambakar, our Legislative Policy Analyst, Casey Addison, and our Financial Analyst, Steve Reister, and my Chief of Staff, Dana Wax. Looking forward to today's hearing. And now, before I call the first panel, which we have our Assistant Chief of the NYPD School Safety Division, Chief Brian Conroy, as well as our Special Counsel on Justice Initiatives, as well as co-chair of the Mayor's Leadership Climate Team on School Climate from the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, we have Theron Pride. Welcome, gentlemen, and looking forward to hearing your testimony today. We appreciate your presence and participation. And now I will have the council uh, administer the oath, and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you once again. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair Gibson and members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Theron Pride, and I am Special Counsel on Justice Initiative to the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I also serve as the newest co-chair for the Mayor's Leadership Team on School Climate. I'm joined by my colleague, Deanna Kaplan, who previously served as co-chair and now leads other initiatives at MockJ. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and following my brief remarks, Chief Conroy will deliver his testimony. The Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice advises the Mayor on public safety strategy and, together with partners inside and outside of government, develops and implements policies aimed at reducing crime, reducing unnecessary arrests and incarceration, promoting fairness, and building strong and safe neighborhoods. Within this context, MockJ has formed a strong partnership with the New York City Police Department School Safety Division and the Department of Education to ensure the well-being and safety of students and staff in the city's public schools while minimizing the use of unnecessary suspensions, arrests, and summonses. Research shows us that all things being equal, when students are suspended or arrested in school, their chances of being held back in school, dropping out, or entering the juvenile justice system increase. In addition, overly punitive responses have been shown to be an ineffective way to improve student behavior and school climate. Furthermore, these punitive responses have been shown to disproportionately impact students of color and students with disabilities, which can have damaging immediate and long-term effects on their development. As the co-chair for the mayor's leadership team, and as someone that has previously worked on these issues as a social worker in public schools and during my time in the Obama administration at the U.S. Department of Justice, I know improving school climate and reducing crime in our schools is a complex problem that will take all of us to solve. This is why the city has made significant investments not only in school safety agents, but in mental health and other programs in schools that emphasize the importance of fostering a safe and healthy climate. This has included more than $47 million annually in school climate reforms generally. Additionally, the city recently announced another $8 million to support anti-bullying initiatives that include a bullying complaint portal for families, community workshops, 
on bullying prevention and reduction, mental health first aid training for schools and communities, increased protection from bullying for students, and funding for student-led gender and sexuality alliances and respect for all clubs. Improving school climate is a critical issue that we must address because as Mayor de Blasio has said, no parent should have to choose between a school that's safe for their child and a school where every student is treated fairly. All schools can and must be both. This work is complicated and we have encountered some very tragic moments as we've worked together to improve the climate in our schools. But this has only caused us to redouble our efforts and recommit to this goal of ensuring schools are safe learning environments for all and every student is treated fairly. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words here today and for helping us consider all that we can do to support the well-being and safety of our students and staff. We're happy to answer any questions following Chief Conroy's testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gibson and members of the Council. I'm Assistant Chief Brian Conroy, Commanding Officer of the New York City Police Department, School Safety Division. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the role of the NYPD School Safety Division in improving school climate. At the outset of my testimony today, I believe it is important for me to state that all students need a safe and supportive learning environment to succeed in the classroom and thrive in their community. And the Police Department is committed to providing a secure, supportive, inclusive, and equitable learning environment in every New York City public school. While last year, 2016-17 school year, was the safest year on record, ensuring the safety of our students, staff and families each day is always ongoing and at the forefront of the Police Department and the Department of Education. It has been over 18 years since the function of the Board of Education Division of School Safety were transferred to the Police Department, giving the Police Department the responsibility for managing school safety personnel and designating school safety agents to be employees of the Police Department. Over the years, members of the Police Department have discussed with the Council the reasons for that change and the level of crime that dangerously compromised the safety and security of the city's public schools at the time to the ultimate detriment of the educational mission. Today, I am, I am pleased to be here to talk with you about the hard work that the School Safety Division has done in improving the safety of the school environment by reducing crime within our schools. Of course, improving school climate and crime within our schools is not something the school safety does on its own. The Police Department and the Department of Education have established a true partnership to work on and on all issues related to school climate, school safety, and training. Additionally, we would not be as successful in our mission without our strong working relationship with school principals, school administration, teachers, parents, and most importantly, the students. As I mentioned previously, last school year was the safest year on record with an 18% decrease in major crimes from the 2014-2015 school year, which was the first full school year under this administration. Additionally, there was an 8% decrease in school-related arrests and 11% decrease in the number of summonses issued by the School Safety Division compared to the 2015-2016 school year. Currently, there is a 2% reduction in the seven major crimes when comparing this school year to last school year. In working in close collaboration with the Department of Education, we are focused on referring minor incidents where appropriate to school administration rather than involving a criminal justice response. We have sought to balance holding youths accountable for while also utilizing school-based interventions in order to provide opportunities for young people to stay in the path toward college and careers. Part of our strategy to ensure the safety of our students is to work to prevent weapons from entering our schools. In this regard, magnetometers play an important role. While all intermediate schools and high schools are subject to unannounced scanning, historically there have been 88 intermediate and high school buildings that have been subject to full-time or random scanning. During this year, scanners have been added to an additional three schools year to date. Weapon recoveries have increased by a third when compared to last year. What is critical to note, however, is that while magnetic timers are, are an important tool for recovering dangerous weapons, our community partners are also a valuable resource as well. Through cooperative working relationship with students, school administration, parents, and others, 
We are identifying more weapons and counting those in the school community among our strongest partners, fostering trust and making our schools safer. Based on a recommendation from the mayor's leadership team on school climate, clear protocols were established for school principals to request the addition or removal of magnetometers. We attribute much of our crime reduction success to enhanced training for the 5,090 school safety agents and 113 police officers and detectives assigned to the school safety division. It is not a coincidence that school climate and school safety improve together as our training has been enhanced. Our new school safety agent recruits participate in a 17-week training program at the police academy. This comprehensive program includes training in the areas of law, police science, behavioral science, and physical education and tactics, and focus on those topics such as bullying, the LGBTQ community, tactical communication, and diffusing hostility. In order to persist, assist in preparing school safety agents for their special role as part of the school community, Department of Education personnel also participate in our training as instructors and address specific areas such as special education, school administration, school governance, adolescent suicide, conflict resolution, bullying, child abuse, and substance abuse prevention. Training also focuses on how to better work with school administration and students in areas of collaborative problem solving, restorative practices, conflict resolution, de-escalation techniques, and working with special needs students. Moreover, training does not end at the recruit level for school safety agents and uniformed members of service assigned to the school safety division. Agents and uniformed members of the service assigned to the division receive training throughout the year in such important areas as problem solving, mediating conflicts, and response to emergency or dangerous conditions such as an active shooter incident. Equally important to the successful work of the school safety division are our partnerships and strong working relationships, including with elected officials and with organizations and advisory groups outside of city government. As you probably know, the school safety division is an integral part of the mayor's leadership team on school climate. The leadership of the school safety division works with representatives from other city agencies, advocacy groups, union leaders, and school principals to develop new ideas and make policy recommendations that will further improve the school environment and further enhance the positive role that our police officers and school safety agents have in creating a safe and productive learning environment. Many of the recent changes the School State Division has made with respect to training, utilizing school-based intervention and the sharing of data are a result of the work of this interagency, interdisciplinary team. The work with the Mayor's leadership team is ongoing and will play an important role in our efforts to continue to improve school climate. In 2016, we partnered with the Department of Education to introduce Team Up Tuesday, in which school safety agents and officers from precincts lead students' grades K-12 and activities focus on teamwork and leadership. The program brings together students and MIPD personnel in productive activities ranging from visual and performing arts to physical fitness and foreign language lessons. In addition, School Safe Division hosts annual events to empower students to reduce verbal and physical confrontations in their school. By engaging in thoughtful dialogue and interaction, students learn about the resources available to them and our personal gain a better understanding of students' needs. One particularly effective partnership has been developed with the Bronx Parent Action Committee, a group of concerned parents who meet with us on a regular basis to discuss new ways to handle crime and disorder in schools and to promote positive school culture. This group has also participated in training school safety agents and continues to provide valuable feedback and counsel. Furthermore, the NYPD has continued its efforts to build positive relationships and trust with students. Youth programs such as Explorers, the Youth of Police Academy, My School Has Rhythm Not Violence, and our Police Liaison Program have been highly successful in bridging the gap between police officers, school safety agents, and students. We continue to work with community-based organizations to maintain and help strengthen positive school climate, and we welcome the Council's assistance in identifying community groups who could work with us on a local basis toward the same end. In closing, the department takes the duty of providing a safe climate in every New York City public school very seriously. The police department and the school safety division will continue to work in a partnership with the Department of Education, parents, students, and the community in furtherance of that responsibility. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I am pleased to answer any of your questions. 
Thank you very much for your testimony and, and certainly your presence in all the work on behalf of the school safety agents that work in our schools each and every day. Uh, I'd also like to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Robert Carnegie, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Council Member Vincent Gentili, and we'll have more members joining us. So the first question I wanted to ask is just in terms of clarification so we all understand um, some of the language used. When you talk about a magnetometer, are you talking about the physical presence of the metal detectors in a school, or are you talking about the, the wands that uh, some of the agents may have? No, we're talking about the metal detection equipment. Okay, the metal detection equipment. Okay, great. Um, I understand that as part of some of the new initiatives to improve school safety and overall school climate, um, the enhanced de-escalation training that now is included and incorporated into the base of training for SSAs at the academy brings us to 17 weeks. Um, can you talk a little bit more about exactly the content and does that apply to all of the new SSAs that are coming out of the academy? And if so, what about the remaining SSAs that have already been trained under the old model? Are they trained in the new CIT as well? First of all, we're very excited about the change that we uh, made to the training. We saw the need to bring more, the agents, more training in the areas of working together with school administration and students, since that's what they're doing for certainly their bigger part of their day. Um, so we added the two additional weeks to, they always did get conflict resolution training, but we expanded that uh, training for an additional two weeks. Uh, we brought in also outside um, experts in the field to do that training and collaborate problem solving and conflict resolution. We've expanded the opportunity for the Department of Education to join us uh, at the Police Academy to uh, assist us with training in areas uh, that they specialize in, particularly in the areas of dealing with special needs students. Um, we also do training outside the academy, so all our new agents have been getting that for the last several years. We also contracted with outside uh, experts in the field of conflict resolution and collaborative problem solving to give all our current agents. So we're very happy to say that as of today, we've had over 4,600 of our agents and police officers trained in a three-day course in conflict uh, resolution. So we've really kind of pushed this agenda forward, and we think it's shown you know, significant benefits. Okay. So the majority of the SSAs have been trained, 4,600 out of 5,090, I believe. So the remaining few hundred, are they being trained, and how is that going, and when do you expect to finish? We think within the next year, we, we should okay. be, uh, year, year and a half, we should be finishing that. Uh, we're also getting, you know, all our agents are now getting uh, and police officers mental first aid training. Uh, we just started that, but we've already, we're over, over 700 of our school safety agent police officers have received that training. So that may take, you know, a couple more years to get through everybody, uh, but we certainly uh, have been adding training that I think better helps the agents to do their job working with the school community inside, uh, inside our schools. Okay. Is that a part of the First Lady's Thrive NYC initiative in terms of mental health first aid training? Yes. Okay. Is there any way to expedite that training? You said a few years. Well, I, I said maybe another year or two. We have, okay. you know, doing 5,000 people training is, 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 a, is a task for us. Right, right. We've done very well with that. So I'll get you a better estimate on when we can uh, hope to have that done by. Okay, and then within the curriculum of the training itself, you talked about the outside experts and, and other instructors that understand obviously with crisis intervention and dealing with so many of our children and students that have social emotional issues. Um, there's been a lot of talk from many advocates and parents alike about the city increasing its capacity of social workers and guidance counselors. We do have school-based health centers, so we have a variety of different levels of resources in our schools today. But obviously, every single school does not have the same in terms of one social worker, one guidance counselor, a school-based health center. Um, I'm very big on the health centers because they do provide medical and dental and vision services, which are really important. Do you see within the curriculum the crisis intervention training, does it include 
the ability of SSAs to be able to identify some of the social emotional needs of students. So a student may be deemed as acting out, but there could be something else that's going on. So do you think SSAs in their training are able to understand what some of those factors are to look for in identifying some of the social emotional needs of students? Yes, they do retreat train that area where they can, which helps them to hopefully recognize these issues. But we also work very closely with the school administration. So part of our training is to encourage that they're not alone in that, in that school building, that they should be working together with guidance counselors, with social workers inside that school. And I think we do an excellent job of being part of the school community and everybody working together to identify issues and also to resolve conflicts. Okay, so while all of the SSAs are trained in the same de-escalation uh, tactics and, and other uh, education, is there anything that's different with SSAs that are assigned to the elementary schools since the students are, are much younger as compared to middle and high school, or is it all the same across the board? We give the same training across the board, and, and the reason for that is that an, an agent assigned to an elementary school could be in a high school the next day or the next week, and the same thing the other way. High school agents assigned to high schools can certainly be assigned to an elementary school and often fill in there. So I think we need to have our agents trained to deal with the wide range of uh, student ages. Okay. Um, wanted to ask about the warning card program. Um, and I actually am a little more familiar with it because a lot of the advocacy and the work leading up to the warning card program came out of the uh, Parent Action Committee. And I first really want to thank you and certainly Assistant Commissioner Ramon Garcia, who still attends the meetings today with New Settlement and the parents, specifically in District 9 in the Bronx. And I wanted to find out if there is an update on the warning card system. I know we started in the Bronx in some of the campuses, uh, high school campuses, but in terms of expansion, uh, where are we looking to expand and how is the warning card system going now? We're very excited about the, uh, the results this time, and this is another collaborative effort with the Department of Education. This is a partnership. This is where we're working very closely with the Department of Education, but also inside the schools, this is where our agents and police officers are working very closely with the school administration. So, you know, we currently are, we went started off in the five campuses in uh, September of 2015. We're now in 16 campuses. And that's 72 schools. Now we're uh, throughout the city. We're in all, in all the boroughs. Um, we've given out a total of 126 warning cards to date. Um, so we're, we're excited about the partnership. And we're looking to see, uh, you know, analyzing the data and to see if we can certainly expand that program. And, and I think we're going to be able to do that based on what we see so far. Okay. The maintenance of the records of the warning card system, is that kept at a school level or is that kept at a central location in terms of the warning cards that are issued to each of the students? How is the, the data maintained? Uh, we track the number of warning cards we issue. We're not keeping records on particularly who gets the warning card. Uh, we're relying on the Department of Education to provide us with feedback on you know, what happens, uh, is there recurring, is there, is a student uh, getting a second warning card? You know, individual inside the school, they would know that, but for us to analyze the data to see how effective, and what we've seen is a very low recidivist rate, and we get that information from the Department of Education where students getting warning cards are not getting involved in a second incident. So that's a positive, we think, uh, you know, showing the program is working. Okay, that's, that's showing a lot of promise. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically on the warning cards, looking at the data that you and the Department of Ed is tracking, are you looking at any patterns or any trends? So if you're at one particular campus, uh, as an example, Theodore Roosevelt in the Bronx, and you notice that on an annual basis there are X number of warning cards that are issued, in terms of trends and identifying any patterns, repetitive students, the same students, 
uh, a particular school on the campus because in essence that should be an indicator where we need to go in and make sure that there are more resources and programs for that particular school on that campus. So are you doing that, looking at any trends? Because you said the recidivism rate is, is decreasing, which is a good thing. So if you're noticing other students that are getting more warning cards than someone who already received it, what are we doing to make sure that the response can come from the school and the department in terms of, of more resources that may be needed in that particular school? Does that make sense? Yeah, we do look at trends all the time. So what we're looking at, and in particular, since we're limited to two areas of the warning cards, two offenses, which is disorderly conduct and marijuana use, okay. so we're looking at the schools to see if we see that there's a particular issue with marijuana in a school, and that's where the Department of Education and working with the schools to and their guidance counselors and their substance abuse uh, counselors that work with students to come up with programs inside that school to uh, get ahead of, you know, why are there, why is there a, you know, a, uh, an increase or the use of marijuana in this particular school, and or if it comes down to disorderly conduct which typically is maybe the students that are acting up or fighting or uh, sh pushing and shoving each other in the school. Um, we look at that issue also to see if there's something we can do together to uh, so diffuse those issues and make sure that they're not happening again. Okay, uh, is a warning card in only high schools? Yes. High schools, okay. And I also know that the School Climate Task Force made a series of recommendations about the warning card program. Um, specifically in conducting some level of an evaluation to determine if any changes, improvements were needed. And then also there was a recommendation of standardized policies and procedures related to the actual warning card system. Um, is that an ongoing conversation or is there anything that you could share with us in terms of improvements that we need to consider for the warning card program? As far as the, the procedures for issuing a warning card, that, that is standardized. We have the same system through, throughout, throughout, the, uh, throughout the school system. As far as analyzing the program, I think we have had discussions about doing that. Uh, and that, I think, is more that the Department of Education can, uh, can answer that question. Okay. Um, I wanted to specifically ask about, you cited a number of statistics on reductions in crime, uh, school-related arrests, 11% decrease in the number of summons, as well as 2% reduction in the seven major crimes when compared to the last school year. So I guess the, the number one question, overall, are our schools really safe? And what are we still doing to make sure that we reduce the number of weapons and items that are coming into our schools? I believe our schools are safe. I think that, that the data has, has shown that over the years. Um, crime has been significant now. We've, we've used the last three years, but it's been down for the last six years that we've had decreases in crime. Um, the issue of weapons, we have seen an increase in weapons, and we certainly acknowledge that, and we, that is a, uh, we take that very seriously, and we're working very closely with the Department of Education to uh, reduce the number of weapons that come to school. So, we take very proactive measures. We think scanning is just one part of that, uh, but the other part is working together with all the other schools to have that cooperative relationship within the school to not only talk to students and talk to parents about the carrying of weapons and uh, into schools, but also that we have that relationship in the school to identify when when somebody may have a weapon. So the scanning is really, it's in 6% of our school buildings. Uh, so we rely on that cooperative relationship throughout the, throughout the school system to identify weapons. Okay, 6%, right? That's they the go percentage? Go by the buildings. Overall? Yeah. Okay. And when we talk about weapons that are identified through um, the magnetometers, what types of weapons are we talking about? We're primarily talking about knives and box cutters. That, that is the, the largest number we get is in those two areas. And that's also where we see our increases. Okay. And is there a protocol that's in place if a weapon is found on a student, 
are, is the student or students typically arrested or does the SSA have a level of discretion and procedures to follow? What happens um, in an instance where a weapon is recovered in a school? Again, at a school level, we're working very close administration, and it depends on the type of weapon that's recovered. So many right. of the weapons that are recovered, matter of fact, the vast majority of them, they're not illegal weapons. So typically a knife is a kitchen knife or something that they get from their house. So that type of knife would be re incident would be referred to the school administration. So we would not make an arrest or give a summons. Uh, on the cases where a knife is illegal, or another type of weapon uh, gets ca uh, carried in, like it's a firearm, obviously, or something other serious weapon, a switchblade type of knife, or other weapons that are illegal, brass knuckles, then the student may be subject to uh, enforcement action, whether it's a summons or an arrest. Okay. So or what happens? Could be, or a juvenile report, just to add right. that, that could, the student could receive a juvenile report based on the okay. age. What happens if a knife is recovered that's deemed that is illegal? Is there a different mechanism to respond to that versus those that are legal? If, if the weapon is illegal, then that student would be subject to an arrest or a summons, depending on, depending on the age, depending on the, uh, the, t the type of uh, weapon. But yes, that student would be subject to some sort of uh, action. Okay, so I guess what I'm asking is all the SSAs have the same procedures and guidelines to follow, um, and it's not up to their own discretion, but it's based on what's in the guidelines that they have to follow if it's a, an illegal weapon versus a legal weapon. Right, yeah, but again, okay. there's very close work with administration on okay. these type of issues. We'll also, uh, we discuss with the students uh, sometimes a student may have something that they carry based on something they're using at their job uh, and we'll verify that information with the school administration and if that's the case sometimes we can also refer that incident to uh, the administration. Okay. I also wanted to ask, um, I've met with a number of advocacy groups, I've met with a lot of youth groups and students themselves, and there generally has been some concern on not safety, while well, safety in schools is important, but I think equally as important is safety outside of the schools during dismissal time and arrival, um, particularly for older students, middle school and high school. And I've noticed myself in, in my district during dismissal, the SSAs do exit the building and walk the perimeter and make sure that you know the students are not necessarily congregating, but they're walking to their destinations. Um, what is being done from school safety division to ensure that while our students are safe in the schools, they're also equally as safe when they are being dismissed and they're going to their destinations. Um, how does that process work? Well, we certainly agree with you that that's an important issue. Students getting back and forth to school mm -hmm. is, is critically important to us that they're able to safely get to school and, and to leave school safely. So as you mentioned, you noticed that we work very closely with the precincts, uh, the patrol officers. Uh, we work also with the transit officers to make sure that there are safe ways to get back. We're very knowledgeable of where the transportation hubs are, and those are the areas that we concentrate on. The agents will monitor those paths um, with going from the school to the uh, to either a train station or a bus stop. But we also work, uh, and you'll also see outside those schools as members of the school administration. So. Uh, Typically, we'll see deans outside, we'll see principals outside, mm -hmm. and we're working closely with them to make sure that that corridor is safe for the students to get back and forth to school. But our, our partnership with the precincts, our partnership with the transit districts is critically important in, in accomplishing that mission. Agreed. Um, do, does the division make an effort to ensure that SSAs um, stay at their posts in terms of the schools they're assigned to so they can build relationships with students? Because I know you said that um, there are times when SSAs that are working at a high school could be transferred to an elementary or middle school, vice versa. Um, but to the best of your, your ability as chief and certainly the division's efforts, keeping SSAs at schools where they can build a relationship is a primary goal as well. It is. I, you'll find throughout the system where typically agents are at schools for extended, you know, period of times. So we do keep that in mind. We know that uh, in working with the uh, 
the principals and the schools, they, they like having their agents there uh, that they have a relationship with and have worked with and that know the students. So we think that's very important. So we do certainly make an effort to keep soon. Now promotions or needs sometimes cause us to have to move agents, but for the most part, agents do stay for extended periods of time in the schools that they're in. Okay. I've also noticed that some schools have both SSAs as well as patrol officers or police officers from the local precinct, I believe. Um, and in your testimony, you cited you have about 113 officers and detectives. How does that work? And in terms of where they're assigned, is there a formula you use? Like, how does that work where some schools have both school safety agents as well as police presence within the school? So that's based on analysis of data, and that's an ongoing every day. Uh, we have now uh, 113 that's assigned to the division. We have 94 police officers in our, in our task force, so that covers throughout the city. So we have to be very be able to move those officers as we see uh, conditions change, and that's like daily we'll review uh, conditions that are going on in schools, and we'll move those officers around to support the agents and the school administration inside the school as needed. Okay, so <clears throat> I guess what I'm asking is, in our overall work with the school leadership climate team, with the restorative justice work, with all of the efforts that we are embarking on to make sure that we focus on prevention and not detention and reactionary work, um, do you see at any point where we can reduce some of those police officers that are physically in many of these schools as you continue to assess data. So if the data is telling you, and I'm assuming it's arrests and other crime data, but population of the school, et cetera, as you continue to assess that, do you see an environment where that number will be reduced and there'll be less police officers in schools as well? Is that a possibility? I won't go to predict that, and I don't necessarily okay. think it's a negative for okay. the police officers to be inside the schools. These police officers for these extensive training, the ones in the school safety division get that conflict resolution training. Uh, we do different, they do work with students in a lot of, in a lot of different areas. Um, so we, we don't think it's a negative that the police officers are necessarily inside a school. We think that they're working together with the school administration, developing relationships with students. So, uh, you know, we'll see where the data takes us but I don't okay. find it to be a negative uh, that the officers are part of that school community. Okay, um, through the leadership climate team, you indicated in your testimony that there are specific protocols that have been identified for principals to either add a metal detector or remove. Is there anything that you could share with us as it relates to any new protocols that have been established? Because when we, when we first started this conversation, um, some time ago, we didn't really know um, some of the details in terms of what factors we look at to determine if a school needs or if a school does not need. And 6% is obviously a very low number, but I think there are many that want to reduce that number even further. Um, obviously, because of the uniform presence in schools, uh, the message that it sends, but overall, just making sure that we I think we, we can invest both in social workers and guidance counselors, but also look at the work school safety does as well. We can do that simultaneously. Um, but specifically protocols from principals, uh, we have a lot of co-located schools with multiple principals, um, which I know sometimes can be a challenge. I have two high school campuses with five schools and five principals and a building manager, so it, it's a lot. Um, how do you identify the protocols that principals establish and and, and implement in order to either add a metal detector or remove one. Okay, so the, you know, there always was a sort of unwritten uh, protocols for principals could ask for metal detection. They could ask for unannounced scanning, um, or they could ask for permanent uh, uh, metal detection in their schools, or to have the um, uh, metal detectors removed from their schools. So. Uh, these new protocols that came out of our work with the mayor's leadership team, we formalized those protocols, so now they're written. Every principal has been uh, uh, issued those protocols, so every principal has the opportunity to either ask for scanning, um, and it could be unannounced scanning, it could be for a day, or they could ask for magnetons to be installed in their schools or removed from their schools. So uh, based on 
those requests, which we don't have. I think we have one request for a principal to uh, have scanning removed and or lowered the level. So we lowered the level from full time to random scanning and we'll continue to analyze what, you know, what the data shows us. But we're based on analyzing data, uh, working very closely with our uh, Department of Education partners to determine where those magnetometers should be. Okay, and I guess my, my last question before I get to my colleagues that I wanted to ask is specifically about the Chancellor's recent announcement to address bullying in our schools and where school safety fits in that. There was a talk about additional training and other professional development for teachers and administrators to identify some of the warning signs potentially, but also services. Um, I think obviously in light of recent occurrences, it, it sheds light for all of us on what we can do as a city to respond better, to ensure that we close any gaps in services, and we really make sure that students and parents understand what services are available. So with the Chancellor's announcement, where does school safety fit um, in terms of any resources that will be available for the school safety division, and how do you see the role that your agents will play in a lot of the new services that will be available in our schools? No, uh, we work very closely with the Department of Education on, on all programs, certainly on bully programs, and we're mm -hmm. working very closely. I'm working very closely with Mark Rambazant right now to uh, sort of update our bullying presentations that we do inside the schools. That's a cooperative relationship that we have. We do do, we actively do do presentations inside school on bullying. We have been doing that. Um, as far as the new initiatives, we look very forward to working with the Department of Education. You specifically mentioned training, certainly training with inside a, uh, a school building. We would certainly welcome the opportunity to certainly be part of that. But since these are new initiatives, I think we have to certainly continue to uh, collaborate on how we can uh, be partners in that. Okay, so if an SSA identifies a student that they believe is a, a victim of bullying, is there a protocol or a series of steps that that agent can take to ensure that that student is getting the assistance they need? Well, that, come, that goes back to our relationship with the school administration. Certainly if a school safety agent identifies a student as bullying, they would certainly bring that to the attention of the uh, school administration and work with the school administration or the parents. They typically sit in on mediation sessions with the, uh, with the school administration if there's, if, the, if there's gonna be a parents brought up for a conference um, to be part of that and we encourage uh, that they're part of the process because they need to know what's going on inside that school and they need to be part of the solution. Okay, okay, okay thank you. I'll continue as I have my colleagues ask questions. We have been joined by Council Member Robert Carnegie, Council Member James Vaca, and Council Member Rafael Espinal. And now we'll have questions from Council Member Lansman followed by Council Member Vaca. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning. Um, so I want to ask you, I hate to be parochial, but I want to ask you about um, a school in my district which has been having some problems, including, uh, I think it was yesterday, a student was caught with a, um, with a gun, unloaded, as I understand it, a real gun, a 40 caliber and a BB gun. Um, this is John Bowne High School in, yes. in Flushing. And last spring, um, some students were arrested. There was a stabbing incident. And my office, we just pulled some, some of the stats. In 2016, 2017, there were 224 total removals and suspensions, nine for weapon possession. It was, the, if I'm reading this right, the 13th most in, in the city. At some point soon, we're gonna have to meet again and go over what's going on in, in this school. But um, what is the department doing to try to get schools that are ha having persistent problems, as I think at this point it's fair to say John Bowne is, and 13th most in, most in the city is not a, a, a distinction to be, to be proud of. Um, what are we doing for these, for these schools in, in particular? 
because there are some schools that are not uh, responding as well to the broader um, game plan as others are. And, and do you have any particular familiarity with John Brown? Yes, I do. So, 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 so John Brown came certainly, uh, you know, last year you mentioned there was a, a stabbing incident inside the school. Uh, we started looking at multiple factors and what, what, might, what might be going on inside that school. Um, and we're working very closely with the school administration on creating a better environment inside the school or, or identifying what the issues might be, uh, making sure that we are in the right areas of the school uh, as far as our patrolling inside the school with our school safety agents, but also working on what our community outreach team has been to the school to talk with students and work with students. Uh, we certainly want to improve the environment. We're uh, certainly concerned. Uh, based on even the issues that happened uh, last Friday. That was the recovery of the uh, fire, one firearm unloaded and, and a BB gun. So uh, the issues can have continued. So we, we need more, we have more work to do. So could you just tell me what, what is the status of, of metal detectors at John Brown and what's the thinking on why it's at the level that it is? So based on the incident that we had in the spring last, at the end of last school year, uh, we had, no, there was no scanning in the school. Uh, now we did put in a random or part-time scanning inside the school. So the scanning equipment is at the school and we work with the school administration and we rotate the days or come up with different days that we do scanning on. So uh, that was the response to that incident. And we were gonna monitor, we, as we were, monitoring conditions this year to see which direction we would go from there. And based on the incident we had on uh, Friday, we've uh, made it starting yesterday, a, doing full-time scanning in that school. Um, so now we're doing it every day, but we'll continue to monitor that to see where we need to go because that's not our only answer. That's just part of the immediate solution, but we'll continue to work uh, with the administration. We put additional agents inside the school. Um, again, we want to work to improve the culture, the climate inside that school just to, so the violence does not continue. So do you mean now that there's, there's full scanning, meaning every child, every kid walking in the, 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 the building goes through the metal detectors? That's correct. Is that, is that a temporary placement or? Well, right now it's, it's there and mm -hmm. it's going to be done every day and we'll evaluate that going forward to see what results we get from that. We'll see what the data shows us. We'll see what with the school climb. We'll work with the uh, administration to f for the feeling inside the school and we see if we can uh, you know, improve conditions inside the school because we're very, con you know, obviously, you know, a person bringing a weapon in there, whether it's unloaded or not, uh, that is a serious, you know, serious issue inside the school. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, and I don't know that metal detectors are the answer on a long-term basis either. I just, I just don't know. Right. Um, have you been able to figure out yet? I, I know this happened, I said yesterday, but it was actually Friday. 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 Um, how did this this student bring the weapon into the school? What what broke down? Was there some screening or random screening that 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 didn't occur, or was there um, some policy? My understanding is, is some of these students had been they weren't even students anymore. They were students who had what we used to say drop out. Like, have, is there anything you can tell us about the incident and the people involved? That's an ongoing investigation, so I won't discuss the specific students. I can say that on that particular day, there was not a breakdown. As I said, we were doing random scanning up to that point of time, so that day we didn't do scanning. So that's just something that... When, when you say random scanning, just so we understand, that means some days you scan and some days you don't, right? That's correct. It doesn't mean it's random in that every day there's some scanning, no. but who gets scanned is random. No, it's random on the basis of the day that we're doing it. Uh, okay. uh, that's... Uh, that's what I mean by random, or I use a quote also part-time scanning. Right? It's probably more accurately described. Forgive me if this was asked before I had to step out, um, but do you feel that you have the, the number of school safety agents you need to, to properly do your job and accomplish your mission? I think we're always assessing the, uh, the needs for agents or the current, the, we have enough agents and there'll be upcoming budget hearings that'll be coming up and that issue will be discussed at those hearings. Okay. 
Well, listen, I, I appreciate and is how difficult it is to calibrate the right amount of, I'll say, police presence, just as a generic term. And we don't want our schools to feel like prisons, and I'm completely on board with the whole movement to de-escalate and de, um, well, just to, to lower the law enforcement temperature in the, in the school buildings. And it's a challenge to, to calibrate it and get it, get it right. Um, but we always want to err on the side of uh, safety. So we'll want to meet again on, on John, John Bound, whether it's at your level or, or, you know, we have a wonderful 107th Precinct. It's terrific. Um, but the parents, rightly so, look at the incident in April and now another incident in November, and they want to feel that something's being done. Not that you all haven't been present in meetings and all this stuff, but like we're, we're getting where now we're getting people want to, how do I get my kid out of the school? And once you get at that level, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lansman. We've also been joined by Council Member Jamani Williams. Next, we'll have Council Member Gentili, then followed by Council Member Vaca. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Chief Conroy. Thank you for uh, being here today with your, with your team. Um, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm curious about the youth programs that you mentioned here. Uh, how did the different, uh, how did the youth programs differ, and how do you decide what schools and how many to put in in those schools? So some of the programs I mentioned was the uh, Explorers Explorer right. program, which right. we we think is a great program. So we're always looking to expand that program. So that, that's something we offer schools. Um, of course, it comes with, we need resources to do it. Uh, it's post advisors, but there's a school safety agent or a police officer. But we work with schools and we offer that program in schools uh, that it's, it's available for uh, the administration schools to work with us and, uh, and join with us on that. But it's not only, we're not the only ones to do that. The precincts do explorer programs. All, each precinct has an explorer program, our housing uh, you, uh, PSAs have explorer programs. So uh, there's other government agencies that have an explorer program. So you know there's a summer camp that they they take a certain number of students to a camp, which is multi agencies. Uh, so that's one of our programs that we think is great. We have a, a youth police academy that we run over the summer. Right. The, how does how do they differ? How does like the the police liaison program differ from the police uh, academy? and the Explorers? So the Explorer program is an ongoing program. So uh, uh, we work in a school or they work out of a priest and that program is going. The Youth Police Academy is just a summer camp program where we had up to 2,000 students in the last year in, in that program where agents and police officers work together with students during a sort of a day camp type of thing, working inside the schools but also taking them on various trips. But that's a limited, that's, that's just for the summer months. Uh, We've started a police li liaison program in uh, two schools in the Bronx uh, where our police officers from various different uh, units within the department are part of the curriculum in the school. So they go into a uh, class, they give a presentation on, it could be uh, crime scenes, working on crime scenes, it could be on domestic violence, and it's part of the curriculum inside the school. So. We're excited about that program, but we're we now when we started one school in the Bronx, we're now in a, in a second school in the Bronx, and, and, and that's something you coordinate. Uh, that's correct. To have the precinct officers go in, we actually take uh, officers from various specialized units. For example, crime scene, domestic violence, they'll come into the school to give a lecture, as well as our own officers go there to talk to students also, and that's working in, in, with the principal to coordinate that as part of their regular uh, curriculum. Is, is there a, a criteria used to determine what program goes to what school, given the resources? It's given resources. So the Explorer program is open to any school or uh, kids can join it at any precinct also, uh, can join an Explorer program. So that's a, that's a sort of a wide open program. As many weeks we can handle, we'd certainly like to see more uh, young people sign up for the Explorer program. So if, if it's available, anyone can sign up? Yes. Right? Okay. Let me just ask you about um, the issue of um, removing magnetometers. Um, what would a principal's reasoning be to you to remove magnetometers? 
Uh, I think a principal would uh, look at what they feel that this, the school has became a safer from the time that the Manitons were originally installed inside the school. And we certainly appreciate the, you know, reviewing that principal's request. Uh, we certainly take those seriously. But in the end, we'll look at the, the data and we'll be driven by that data and what our own uh, will make that decision based on a review of that data with the, the Department of Education. So ultimately, it's your call in the particular school? Yes. The final decision uh, rests with the police department to make that. Right. Thing. So there could be instances where you and the principal disagree? Yes. I see. Um, we, over the last day or two, um, have been um, told through news reports that there have been um, requests by educators at uh, Brooklyn College to uh, ask the NYPD to back off, um, to become a, a less of a high profile on uh, campus, um, to sort of be unseen uh, on campus. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, has the DOE or any employee of the DOE made that request of the school safety uh, officers or, or to you? I'm not aware of that at all. Um, in fact, you're going the other way. You're trying to get more involved, aren't you? We, we, are, we want to have the appropriate level of involvement in the school. Uh, we think we're an important part of the school community in keeping that school safe, but also to also improve in the school climate. So uh, just based on your testimony, it appears that, that your collaboration with the schools seems to be opposite of what, what seems to be taking place at the college level, at, at Brooklyn College at least. I won't speak to that because I'm not aware of it, so I'm not going to speak on that. All right, let me ask you this. Should you ever get a request like that to back off, what would your response be? Our response would be to evaluate the situation and uh, what, the, what the data is. I don't expect to have that request, um, but if I did, I would, we would take that a as it came and it would depend on the circumstances itself. Right? right, and as you said, ultimately you make the call. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Gentili. Next, we'll have Councilmember Vaca, and we've also been joined by Councilmember Haim Deutsch. Thank you, Madam Chair. What fell through the cracks with the Wildlife Conservation School in the Bronx? Uh, before that, I just want to clarify that with, with the previous uh, council member's question. We're not in colleges, so to just to clarify that, uh, school safety is not in colleges. Uh, we're only in high, high public high schools and intermediate and uh, elementary schools. Um, as far as what fell through the cracks uh, in wildlife, I don't know if anything fell through the cracks. We're certainly, um, it's a tragic incident. Uh, we take that incident certainly very seriously. Um, and we're certainly reviewing, and, and matters are still under investigation regarding that particular incident. Um, but no, I, I say that because communication had to fall down at one point or another. Communication had to fail. If you have parents and students filling out forms telling DOE that they do not feel safe in their schools, that they are afraid, those surveys came back saying that the school atmosphere was frightening to them in many respects. Where do those surveys go and where is your specific unit communicated with? How does that funnel down to you? There was no metal detector in the building. Did the principal there ever request a metal detector or was there never a request for one, even though the survey showed a, a concern over student safety. I'm going to bring my partner up here uh, in the Department of Education to sort of uh, help with this question. I think it's a I think it's something that we work together on, so I think it's important that uh, that we talk about this together. Okay. Just identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Mark Rampersant, Deputy CEO for Safety and Security for the Department of Education. 
So specifically, I'm not aware that the principal ever asked to have magnetometers installed inside that school. Um, so as far as I, I know, there was never a, a request. You know, the matters of what happened inside that school or is still under investigation, but I'm not aware of any request by the principal to have magnetometers installed inside that school. How many school safety agents are there, are there there in the school now as compared to before that incident? We now have a level three and we have five agents inside the school. You have five level eight, I'm sorry. A level three is a supervisor. One, one level three? Yes. And how many level eight? And I think we have five. Five. Five, so you have six security guards in that entire building because there are several schools there, I'm aware. Correct. What did you have before the incident? We had a, a, a level three supervisor and we had two agents inside. So you increased dramatically the number of agents, more exactly. than double the number of agents. Correct. My concern, and I appreciate that you did that, but my concern is that we are in a position where we, we reacted. The city put metal detectors in the next day. We more than doubled the number of school safety officers, yet the parents and the students in this building were crying out for help based on the surveys they filled out and no one listened. Based on those surveys alone, you, you indicate the principal did not ask for metal detectors. How? How did a principal not ask for metal detectors, as you indicated? And if the principal didn't, why didn't DOE look at their own surveys and say, we better intervene here? Forget the principal for a second. Why didn't DOE look? Aren't they supposed to analyze these surveys and say to themselves, we have to take action, whether, whether the principal's asking for it or not? So I bring that to your attention. I, I think something fell through the cracks here. How many, how many schools now have metal detectors? There's 91 buildings that have metal detectors. 91 schools have metal detectors. 91 you, school campuses. Also. 91 school campuses. Mm -hmm. Is that number, do you anticipate increasing that number or decreasing that number? I, I, we analyze the data, so I, I'm not going to say it's going to go up or down. We're going to analyze the data, and where that takes us, that's where we'll go. When you, when you consider removing metal detectors, and I had read articles several months ago that that was under consideration to remove many of the metal detectors, who was consulted in that process about whether or not to remove metal detectors from a school? We never said we were going to remove metal detectors from the school. What we did say is that we would evaluate the metal detectors in the school and analyze data uh, and to determine if there, if schools could be re potentially be removed or if schools needed to be added onto it. So we're open in both directions to do that based on analyzing data, based on working very closely with the uh, school administrations inside the schools. So we haven't had requests to remove scanning except for one school that we downgraded the scanning from full time to random scanning. Do, um <coughs> I, I think I, I heard my colleague, Councilmember Lanceman, referring to John Adams High School in Queens, but I just want to be sure I heard correctly. John Bown. John Bown. John Bown, I'm sorry. John, John Bown High School in Queens does not have metal detectors. It does now. It, did it does? Not, it did not in uh, prior to May of uh, this year. It did not have metal detectors. It was a non-scanning school. Now it does. Yes, it does. So. My question, obviously, I think the answer is yes, but there, the, uh, my question is there are high schools in New York City that do not have metal detectors. Right. There are high schools. There are high school campuses yes. that do not have metal detectors. Yes. How many intermediate schools have metal detectors? None. None. Just to be like, I can get you that data? You have schools. No, no elementary schools. No so. elementary, intermediate. So. No, no intermediate schools. I'm no, intermediates do have it, but I'll get you the exact number. Yes. But there are several. I, I was so clear. scanning. Scanning is only subject to our our middle schools and our high schools. No, that's what I meant. Intermediate, right. intermediate. schools. I mean, I'm using the same term. Middle schools. Right. So how many middle schools have metal detectors? Well, we would have to look down. Look at the breakdown. We don't. I mean, the breakdown is. Not we can get you that. Here. We can get you that number. And I am I to assume that no elementary schools have it. Correct. No. No. No K to five schools have it. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's fine. In addition to metal detectors, you do random. We do random we do unannounced checks. scanning. So, 
every intermediate and high school is subject to be uh, unannounced scan. So that's mobile. We have the equipment on trucks and we take that equipment to schools and we do at least one school per day. Uh, we take that scanning equipment and we scan the school. And again, based on requests from principals, based on data analysis, uh, we uh, move to a prior incidents in the school, we take that, uh, uh, we move the scanning around. We, so we have the capabilities to do it in, in at least one school uh, each day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Member Vaca. I just wanted to continue in that same question. Um, the random and the rotating scanners that you have, how often do you analyze the data? Is it week to week? You said that there is potentially one school each day that gets a random scanner at their school just for the day. Um, how do you look at the data? How often do you review it to determine um, those particular schools that are selected? We consistently review it daily. So we may have an incident today that in a non-scanning school that would, we would say, let's go there and do scanning tomorrow. All right, so we look at that information daily, historically going back, but also what's, what's occurring right now. So we call that unannounced scanning. So I just want to be clear, so sometimes can, we call that unannounced scanning. Unannounced as in no one knows at the school? Well, the school administration knows. Okay. So that they know the day before, so the school oh, okay. administration does know that. Okay, so the SSAs know you let the principals know that it's coming the next day? Correct. Okay, and then how often do you review the data to determine, uh, I'm very big on trends and patterns because it's usually a sign that something is wrong. Um, how often do you review and analyze the data if you see too many schools that are getting unannounced visits, so to speak, um, of a scanner, how long do you wait to determine if something else is going on in that particular school um, before you take any level of action? So we would react uh, you know, quickly to the data analysis. So for example, if we see a school that we recovered weapons on a particular day when we did unannounced scanning, we'll come back to that school again at some point in time. And based on you know, continued analysis, that's why I say it's ongoing, that we're looking at the analysis, uh, the, the information daily to see uh, if we should raise the level from no scanning to either random scanning or if we don't if we go there and we don't get any weapons and that's another thing we take into consideration uh, we, we may not need to go back to that school so we're analyzing that data daily and, and, and things come up on a daily basis where we may have to go to a school as I mentioned the next day, or we may wait a couple of days, you know, strategy-wise to say, oh, we'll wait, we'll wait a couple of days, we'll go on and out scanning. Uh, so, but we work closely with the administrations on that. And, uh, and again, that's an ongoing process of analyzing that data. Okay, and in that regard, um, how does it work, especially with DOE and school safety, in those particular instances where there is something going on where there is a repetitive behavior or there are weapons that are recovered during unannounced scans. Going into the school to determine if there are gaps in services and programs that are available. Um, and I'm very big on indicators and factors and warning signs, um, flags that are raised because of this that propel us to go into a school and say there are gaps in services, maybe we need to do an assessment on the level of programs guidance counselors, social workers. Um, do you do that and how often is that done? And then the other part of my question, school leadership teams, every school has an SLT. Is school safety a part of that and do you meet regularly with the school team at, at each particular school? They are part of the, certainly the safety part of that and there are okay. regular safety meetings. But going back to the analog like that, we share the data that we get from, a, from an unannounced scanning uh, with the Department of Education that day that it happens and we have the discussions on what else can we do in that school. For example, we see that we did recover weapons in school. Now we'll look to see what can we do inside that school 
to maybe improve the climate inside that school. It may be presentations by our community outreach team. It may be some other action that the Department of Education administration is going to take. It may be the SSA is working together with the school administration to identify what may be issues uh, in that school that are causing uh, students to, uh, you know, carry weapons. Okay. And in addition, I want to further understand, uh, I believe Councilmember Gentile talked a little bit about the Explorers and all of the other programs that really the Community Affairs Division of the Safety of SSD really has. Um, I've participated in my school has rhythm, not violence, and I really love the work. Um, I've been a part of anti-bullying demonstrations and presentations. Uh, when we have anti-bullying month, where we recognize obviously that we have to do a lot more, respect for all week and some of the other things. I think I've been a part of everything. Um, Coupled with all of that, uh, where do you see any improvements that need to be made? So as an example, um, the NYPD has the Neighborhood Coordination Officer Program, right? The NCO program, where they divide the precinct into sectors, and each sector has an NC two NCOs that are assigned to work within that particular sector. Um, are there any other opportunities that school safety is looking to identify to ensure that we can have greater partnerships and more engagement with our youth? So outside of all of the monthlies, I call them monthlies, um, what else are we doing to make sure that we are engaging with the school students as well as our administrators? Well, I think you brought up a point of point. That's why we're working together now with the uh, Department of Education, uh, particularly we're working with uh, the Community Affairs Bureau, uh, with Chief Jaffe, as and we have been in ongoing, in ongoing discussions uh, with Mark Rampersen on how we can incorporate more people into this, so including our neighbor coordination officers. So we're working on our bullying presentation now to see if we can have a presentation that not only we could do, but our neighborhood coordination officers could be involved in also uh, going into schools and participating in in programs such as uh, anti-bullying presentations. So we we moving forward. We are looking to do more, and I'm really confident we will be doing more. Okay. Do you see and anticipate any further recommendations coming out of the school leadership climate team as it relates to school safety agents? I think in general, I expect some further recommendations from this. We had a, uh, a meeting a few weeks ago, and I think uh, we're excited about you know some of the things that were brought up at that meeting uh, about going forward and working together and coming up with more recommendations. Uh, so we're excited about that partnership that we have. We don't always agree on everything at these meetings, but that's what it's about. I think it's about us getting together and opening up the discussion and having these discussions about issues that I think are, are serious and things that we need to work together on. So we're excited about going forward. I think the mayor's leadership team is, uh, is going well. Under, uh, so we think we, we're going to accomplish a lot. And Chief, if I can just mm -hmm. add to that, uh, Chair Gibson, I, I think with the mayor's leadership uh, team here on school climate, there is that opportunity, that potential for further dialogue and conversation about what more can be done. Um, to the extent recommendations can go forward from the, uh, from the team, uh, we'll certainly look at that. And as the chief was saying, you know, this is a partnership, a strong partnership across a lot of city agencies as well as community and community advocates. And so we want to use every opportunity that we have to bring the best minds together uh, through that process of collaboration on the team. So to just kind of reiterate and, and emphasize your point uh, about the, the value of that team, uh, that we certainly can use that as a way to further dialogue and, and kind of consider what are some more best approaches that we could be taking. So I just think that's a good question that you've asked us. Okay. And I guess I have just a, a few more questions. I wanted to understand uh, the respect for all training for school safety agents. As I understand, is there a liaison that's designated at each school? I believe that's DOE staff that is responsible for ensuring that SSAs are trained in our respect for all students and some of the work that we're doing around that. Can you confirm that for me? Yeah, that's, that's a Department of Education responsibility. Okay. You have a respect for all liaison at each school. Yeah. Does that come under your uni unit? Well, it comes under our respective office, the Office okay. of Safety and Youth Development, yes. Okay, is that, so is that ongoing and underway? Oh, absolutely, that is ongoing. Okay, okay, got it. Um, I also wanted to 
ask a question since when we talked about school leadership climate and school discipline and you know the pipeline to prison, the disproportionate impact obviously that some of these harsh uh, discipline and penalties has on students of color, LGBTQ students, students with disabilities, immigrant students, uh, vulnerable students. So I wanted to ask with all of the work we've done, the school leadership climate team year two of completion, where do you see the work that we're doing having a greater impact on the students that have been faced by the most harshest of penalties? So with all the work that we're doing, and even now with the warning card system, and looking across the entire portfolio, students of color are the ones that are having this disproportionate impact and are at the greatest disadvantage. So how do we turn that around to make sure that the work we're doing gives them a greater advantage? So they're not feeling the burden of being a statistic or any other category. Sometimes I, it's concerning that you know we put everybody in categories. It bothers me. But what are we doing to make sure that students of color and students that are, have been faced under some of these harsh penalties are feeling the improvements that we are working so hard to achieve? Well, if I can, I'll respond first, and I'll, I'll turn to some of my colleagues here on the panel. I'll just quickly say from um, my time briefly here with the leadership team, I know there's a real intentional look at the data around mm -hmm. the populations that you just right. discussed and who are impacted. And I think in the direction that we're going with, with the partnerships around really working together to find uh, not only solutions to reducing uh, arrests and summonses and suspensions in schools, but really thinking about what are those programs that specifically support those young people who, again, oftentimes turn to be the most vulnerable students in our, in our school community. And so being data-driven is certainly first and foremost in this work, and I believe our colleagues here can say more. I'd also say that um, my perspective coming at this from the national level is I know that this is a particularly persistent challenge that many school districts have faced across the mm -hmm. country. And I think just your point and your question to continually call it out. I think that is a real value of the school leadership team partnering with the advocates and people on the ground who see this day in and day out. The fact that New York City is intentionally talking about this and looking at programs, thinking broadly about school safety beyond just metal detectors, realizing that schools have a certain feel and a certain identity, and students that walk into those school buildings take on that feel and that identity. And so being really intentional about that school climate and what's the message we send to our young people. Are we sending messages for them to succeed, or are we mm -hmm. sending them messages that are more negative and impact their development in a negative right. way? So I would say that because we have this school climate uh, leadership team and this collaboration and these partnerships, the fact that we're calling it out and addressing it intentionally by looking at the data is certainly first and foremost an excellent way I think we, we have going forward. But I, I certainly will um, defer to my colleagues here to maybe offer a few more specifics. Okay. Hi, I'm Lois Herrera. I'm CEO of the Office of Safety and Youth Development within the Department of Education. And I'm so glad you asked the question because we're particularly proud of the work that we've done in the last year and a half, two years, with restorative practices. Um, and you asked, you mentioned harsh discipline, and uh, with the help and advice of the mayor's leadership team, as as well as help from city council, we've expanded the initiatives that we have that are pretty deep. They're they're slightly different initiatives um, based on. Um, the, the source or the, or the intent, but we have seen really dramatic results in, in the 105 or so schools that have gone very deeply with restorative practices. There's one initiative that's with, in collaboration with City Council, another initiative within the warning card, the original warning mm -hmm. card campuses, as well as all of the schools in District 18. And while we had an overall reduction of over 6%, 6.4% in suspensions last school year. In schools that had restorative practices, the results were very much more, way more dramatic. So we're very proud of that work, and that's very promising. Okay. I did hear about the District 18 work, and, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we would love to see that universal. Um, and I know that we have to certainly pick and choose the locations based on need and priority and funding and capacity as we move forward. But um, I'm certainly looking forward to expanding that. Certainly would love to have a presence in the Bronx. Um, District 9, District 9 always needs. And my advocates from District 9 have really put forth and 
a priority and a real plan to make sure that a lot of that work can be expanded to District 9. Um, and so while I'm not, you know, throwing my district out there, certainly I want to make sure that as you look to expand, looking at priority locations is obviously very key. And I'm happy to support that as well. So part of the, the bullying package that we announced several mm -hmm. weeks ago, we are going to expand to three new districts, uh, the Restorative Practices Initiative. We have not yet decided. We're looking, oh, okay. reviewing data. Um, but we are expanding, and we're really excited about that. Oh, OK. Maybe that's why there's a push. So when, are, when is the department going to make the selection on the three districts? We're in process. Oh, OK. So will that happen this year, or? Yes, it will okay. happen this year. OK, great. Thank you. OK. And I guess my last question is an important one. A couple of years ago, I was very proud to work within the council and lead the efforts to amend the Student Safety Act, which is reporting that the department provides to us on the number of students that are issued summons, arrested, um, as well as suspended. And I wanted to specifically ask, uh, pursuant to the Administrative Code 14-150, Five zero is the reporting part. Specifically, um, there is no report on the number of SSAs per school and the average number per quarter based on a public safety exception that we're using that's been written in law. I think it may be called, is it? Right. Right, it's the public safety exception that's written in law. So I wanted to understand what information can be reported to us that does not compromise public safety. Are we able to see the number of SSAs, uh, whether it's per police precinct, um, per borough? Is that something that we're able to get without uh, violating any, any public safety measures or compromising, rather? Hello there. Good afternoon, good afternoon, council member. Uh, I think we can certainly look at some of the some of the ideas that you just uh, suggested, meaning the number of SSAs by precinct, with the understanding there were multiple schools in a precinct. Um, the type of data that we have given in response to that data point is the total the total staff allotment in school safety mm -hmm. uniform versus SSAs, but we've kind of stayed away from uh, indicating how many SSAs are per school because first, as the chief had mentioned earlier in the testimony, that number does shift uh, from day to day, so the resources are redeployed. And second, from a public safety position, we really rather not create the roadmap of of identifying schools that may not have sufficient, uh, well, not that it's insufficient manpower, but based on the size of the school for individuals that, that are looking to do harm to map out um, the manpower and potentially try to find cracks to uh, bring weapons or try to make the school environment less safe. Right. No, no. And I understand that. Certainly, this council is never asking the department to do anything or comply with local law where public safety is compromised. But I think what you will find in the reports that we are getting as a matter of the local law, but just also in terms of the work we're doing, the majority of the metal detectors that we have in schools today I know are in the same communities where we're trying to address vulnerable students. Students of color, students with disabilities, immigrants, LGBTQ students, it's the same students we're talking about. So obviously, the reporting for us is a greater understanding of where the trends and patterns are, but also for us, it's a call to action of what further work needs to be done to say to us why these particular schools, and again, we're not asking for school data itself in terms of the schools, but if you can extrapolate it, if it's a geographical, if it's a police precinct, if it's community board, um, I mean, there are several ways that we can go about doing this. We just wanted to make sure that it was put forth as a recommendation because what we're getting now is really not sufficient. We'll Does that make sense? Sure, we'll certainly look into it. Okay, okay, great. Um, do it in my... You have questions? Okay, great. Let me get to Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good, uh, good morning. 
Um, so I have um, um, a concern which I'd like to bring up. So uh, most recently I visited one of my uh, uh, CUNY college and one of the concerns I had was that there was um, uh, drug use outside of the college like right after class and at times I received complaints of, um, when I say drug use, it could mean, mean also marijuana use, uh, inside the campus. Um, so if there is uh, smoking um, marijuana or, or using other types of drugs outside the campus, like right after class, that would mean that people are coming on the campus with, um, with drugs, uh, narcotics on, on their possession, on their possession. So my question to you is, in the school system, do you believe that there are students um, that have on their possession um, narcotics while in class? We, we, we don't cover colleges, so just at the outset to say that, uh, we're, we're not covering colleges. Uh, but as far as, you know, we're always certainly uh, looking to see if uh, there is uh, narcotics present inside of schools. Uh, we do document uh, when we do recover uh, narcotics, uh, largely it's marijuana, and, and so if we're going to do recover anything. But certainly we look for that, and that's why we work with the school administration, uh, with their guidance counselors. The warning card program uh, particularly covers uh, possession of a small amount of marijuana, and that's when we work with the school administration, refer the, uh, that student to a guidance counselor or a substance abuse counselor when necessary. So that's something we do certainly look for, uh, but uh, I can't say anything further than that. So uh, what is the protocol, like when a student walks in, do you, do you believe that when a student walks in, they should be, he or she be, should be asked, uh, do you have, are you carrying anything illegal? on your possession, or is that something you do, or you, or you just take it as, you know, if someone happens to mention that someone has some type of, uh, um, some type of drugs on them, then, you know, we will check that out. Because, you know, my concern is, is that a school is supposed to be a safe place, um, and if we should know that students are carrying uh, narcotics on their possession, then that there should be some type of protocol or some type of additional training um, that uh, school safety and DOE should do in order to prevent something like that from happening. Because if you have a metal detector, yeah, it will tell you if the person, if the child or student has a weapon, but many of the schools don't have those metal detectors, and a metal detector cannot tell you if someone has, uh, is carrying anything on their possession that might be uh, other than a weapon. So, so the answer would be no, we don't just ask students if they're carrying a weapon or anything else. Uh, I don't think that would be an appropriate use of our resources. Um, we do certainly, again, work with administration. If there's a reason, if we have suspicion or probable cause uh, to uh, look more closely at a particular student based on information we may receive from either with, from within the school or if a school administration person identifies somebody who uh, may be in possession of something they're not supposed to have, then we would work with the, the uh, school administration in that particular incident. But there's no random uh, answering of questions or uh, students. So, uh, Chief, you don't have to answer the next question. It could be someone from DOE. But if someone, um, like if you take any given, let's say, high school or middle school, without questioning a student, without knowing anything, without even looking, do you feel that there is a percentage that would be in that school that is carrying some type of drug on, their, on his or her possession? That means if you wouldn't ask, if you wouldn't even look, and you would have 700 students in one building, would you assume? I would not assume, no. I wouldn't assume without any evidence of, of, of drug use or acting in a manner that, that would make one believe that a student is under the influence, um, we wouldn't just automatically assume. So do you have any stats of um, how many reports there are in a given school 
of um, someone reporting someone carrying drugs or using drugs? We have stats of reported um, drug use in school or students in possession of drugs. We don't what is that those. number we overall in the New York City school system? We don't have that number here right now. Is it a high number, a low number? Uh, considering the, the size of the school system and the number of students, uh, the number is a, is a low number. So it's a low number, but you have, I mean, considering the size of the school system, it's a low number, but you still have those numbers that people are carrying drugs in a school that is supposed to be a safe place. So if you, um, if you think about not having those numbers and, you know, you, ha you have no stats whatsoever, so what is the school system doing in order to prevent uh, any type of drugs being brought into a school? Well, so um, as the chief mentioned, the Department of Education, we have SAPIS workers that do um, drug presentations, anti-drug presentations for young people. Um, any young person that we find that is in possession or under the influence, they, their guidance counselors are working with those young people and um, further external interventions are provided if needed. Is that 100% proof? Um, would that be 100% uh, proof that someone should not bring in any type of uh, drugs into the school? Or this is more uh, preventive measures? So the education is the preventative measures. Um, and in terms of uh, the provisions made to individual students, those are obviously the case by case. So in other words, people could still come inside having uh, drugs on their possession and by you having an educational preventive measures and not actually knowing if someone's walking into school with drugs, you, wouldn't, you would have no idea. We would have no idea if a person is in possession of if drugs. If someone's in possession. So there's no additional training that you think should be given or something should be done in policy in order to um, make it 100% drug free in, in our school system? I'm not sure what that training would be, but we definitely welcome any ideas um, on how, uh, ways by which to uh, ensure that schools are 100% drug free. Thank you. Okay, that's what I wanted to hear, and I think we should continue this conversation to make sure that our schools are 100% drug free as best, um, as best as we can do um, to make sure our kids are safe in school. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Deutsch. Um, just my final question, um, are there any instances where with some of the legislation that the City Council advances that is codified in local law, um, where there are amendments to the NYPD's patrol guide, if there are any instances where there's an amendment that's applicable to school safety, how does that work to ensure that all of the SSAs are trained in terms of knowledgeable and understanding what those changes could potentially be. Has that happened before? It's just a question that I thought about. Um, if there are any patrol guide changes that relate specifically to, to school safety. Sure, so it's, uh, I guess the answer would be, it would, it would work the same way that any time the council or the state or passes a piece yeah, of legislation. Yeah, I forgot about Albany. <laughs> right. Um, we assess the impact of that legislation mm -hmm. on the department as a whole or any particular specific subset, <laughs> subset of the department, and then we tailor the training accordingly. So whether, and I, I know you've seen plenty of this, whether it's uh, an amendment to the patrol guide to the patrol guide whether it's a finest message that goes out whether we do it during roll call training and train officers before they're deployed to patrol whether we train the training sergeants and the police academy whether uh, there's a variety of of ways that we could disseminate the information now we have uh, the ability to with the officers having smartphones they're able to watch um, tutorials on the intranet. So there could be a tutorial created and uploaded and officers could actually watch it on their, inter on their smartphone okay. as well. So there's a variety of ways that we can do the training and we tailor it accordingly. 
Okay, thank you. So it is exactly 12 o'clock. I have three more panels that are following you. First, I always ask if it's possible to con keep someone from school safety and Department of Ed and Mock J. Um, it would be great so you can hear the remaining panels um, who are youth as well as some of the advocacy groups that are um, certainly very uh, active in terms of the work we're doing on school climate. That will be great. And then secondly, I want to thank you because I have not had school safety on this committee in over a year since we amended the Student Safety Act and we had other legislation related to security in non-public schools. So it's been a while, so it's great to have you back. And certainly as this year is ending um, and we do have, you know, obviously new leadership coming into the city council, I really want to take an opportunity publicly to say it's been a pleasure to work with you as a partner, as an advocate in a lot of the work we've done. This administration has been very deliberate and aggressive in its priority of keeping children safe, but really being creative at doing it. Not just having a police presence in school safety, but bringing everyone to the table. I have not seen this since I've been in office, and it's really pleasing because it recognizes that we all have a role to play. And I'm thankful for that. I thank you for being a part of the School Leadership Climate Team. I thank you for your work. Um, I travel throughout my district, as you know, so I speak to SSAs all the time. And I really want to continue to engage with all of the events. The Youth Academy, I go to the graduations. Just amazing work that we're doing that obviously I want to build upon. Um, certainly it's the floor and not the ceiling, so that means we strive and aim to continue to do better. So I thank you for your work. I thank you for your partnership. I thank you for your commitment. And I'm certainly looking forward to working with all of you in the future. Um, public safety chair or not, uh, we are looking forward to working with you. So I thank you for being here today, and please uh, continue to keep someone here for the remainder of the hearing so that you can hear uh, the rest of the panels that are coming after you. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you. Our next panel is our young people. I'm calling our youth up to the panel from the Urban Youth Collaborative, Keith Fuller, from Make the Road, New York, and Urban Youth Collaborative, Adilka Pimentel, from Future of Tomorrow, Onyx Walker, from Urban Youth Collaborative, Roberto Cabanas, from Center for Popular Democracy, Urban Youth Collaborative, Kate Terenzi, as well as Urban Youth Collaborative, Jorky Badillo. If I butchered your name, I apologize. Call the names again. Keith Fuller, Adilka Pimentel, Onyx Walker, Roberto Cabanas, Kate Terenzi, and Jorky Badillo. Thank you everyone for being here. So you can begin first, just make sure you identify yourself for the record. And we do have a time frame simply because there are panels behind you and there is another hearing coming into this room at one o'clock. So I wanna make sure we get an opportunity to hear from everyone. But once again, welcome and thank you so much for joining us at today's hearing. Thank you. Make sure your microphone's on. Okay, there you go. Hi, right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jorge Badillo. I am a youth organizer at Sisters and Brothers United. 
Uh, throughout my work, I've come to notice that youth have a chance to be their best self uh, only when they receive the full and positive support that their capacity demands. In any environment, a child thrives through encouragement, a child thrives through, through rewards, and having positive influences in their life, and not through punishments. So we take two scenarios, Rico and Evan. They both steal a bag of chips. While Evan gets caught by law enforcement, Rico escapes. Evan gets a violation and probation. Rico, Rico on the other hand, confesses to his role model, who then convince, convinces Rico to return the bag of chips and apologize to the store owner. While Evan faces the consequences of their actions, Rico learns the errors and his mistakes. Both didn't know any better. However, one received the support from a positive influence when it was needed. So can we not say that similar scenarios do take place in our education system today? I graduated from Samuel Gompers High School in the Bronx. This was in 2011. At the time, the ratio of guidance counselors to students was one to 100. Even then, our retention rate was 25%. Out of 224 students in my graduating class, only 56 made it. We saw that counselors weren't able to reach all students. They were not able to accommodate such workload while handling 100 per plus personalities in the school. Due to this, some of my classmates did not receive the support and guidance needed to walk down the aisle with me. And it is unbelievable that this ratio has nearly quadrupled in the last seven years. We now have a, a regulation of one guidance counselor to 407 students. In my experience, I can say it barely worked in my environment. So how can it work with a much higher ratio? Just like in the scenario of RICO, positive influences can provide space for growth, to rectify mistakes, and to learn deeper and stronger values. Through increasing and investing in support systems of students, our communities can continue to reduce incidents like linked with bullying and conflicts in school. When I think of a safe school, I think about peace circles. I think about fellow students resolving conflicts with their words and expression. And in times of conflict, being equipped with the tools that keep young people close to a supportive environment, not just to de-escalate situations, but also to guide in better paths. So I ask, let us be RICO's role model. Let us give schools the capacity and tools to hire more role models like RICO's. You know, we know that guidance counselors and social workers are the key to creating supportive communities in our schools. And unfortunately, the current discipline, the current dis discipline practices that are going on in our schools are not working. We know this already. Thank you very much. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Adilka, and I'm a youth organizer with Make Their Own New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. Over a decade ago, I sat in this very seat as a high school student testifying about my experiences as an undocumented queer Latina attending high school in Brooklyn. My everyday lived experiences was struggling with invasive, aggressive, and dehumanizing school safety policies and practices. As a student, I was fighting for the city to change its approach to school safety and discipline and to give young people the social, emotional, and mental health resources all young people deserve. Instead, the city gave us suspensions, arrests, and summons. Today, I am here on behalf of the young people I organize with who face the same policies and practices I faced and continue to struggle to be heard. We knew then, as we know now, that metal detectors and policing are ineffective school safety strategies but yet the city continues to pour over $400 million a year into the school to prison pipeline. Research shows police officers and metal detectors do not reduce incidents of fighting, bullying, or conflict. But more importantly, our experiences tell us this. I remember mornings where I felt traumatized knowing I was going to have to go through metal detectors and scanning and the disrespect and harassment we faced just trying to get into the school. I remember watching confused, scared, and angry as the NYPD handcuffed a fellow classmate having a mental health crisis. 
Today, 97% of students handcuffed because of a mental health crisis are black and Latinx. It is a disappointing and disheartening feeling to not have enjoyed my four years of high school because of the hyper-aggressive, punitive, and zero-tolerance environment of the school. My experience as an undocumented student was filled with fear and anxiety of being introduced to the very unforgiving school to deportation pipeline. New York City is the only home I have known and the idea of being uprooted from my home and community was frightening and agonizing. Due to continued policies that criminalize black and Latinx youth for normal youth behavior, undocumented students continue to be vulnerable. 78% of all arrests, summons, and juvenile reports are for non-criminal violations and misdemeanors. We should be here discussing how we can get the mayor to pass an operations order to eliminate the practice of arrest and summons for low-level infractions and not embedding police deeper into school discipline. It pains me to sit in this very seat over 10 years later as someone who works closely with young people who attend these same high schools and are going through the same thing I did. The young people of New York City deserve to go to a school where the humanity is respected, valued, and when there is a safe and supportive learning environment. I am here today to say that we do not need school safety agents or police inside of our schools. We need more counselors, curricul uh, curriculum that's culturally responsive, mental health services, and safe, inclusive spaces for members of the LGBT community. These things will provide a nurturing school climate that allows building and sustaining a healthy community, creativity, growth, and success. The young people of New York City know what they need and have been calling for the same thing for years. They should be the ones asking the questions. When is the city going to recognize what they need isn't policing in their schools to keep them safe, but the true safety of having the resources that address their needs, trauma, and academic goals needed for them to graduate? Thank you. Thank you very much. You may begin. Hello, my name is Keith. I am currently a college student and youth leader at Make the Road New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative. Recently, the Urban Youth Collaborative released a report that detailed evidence-based strategies to ensure schools are safe and supportive using our personal experiences in New York City schools and over 30 years of research in school discipline and safety. As a recent former high school student, I can attest to the validity of the information found in this report. Like most of the youth in my neighborhood, I went to school with the expectation from my family that I must be the very best I can be in order, in order to one day break the cycle of living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, none of my parents had the opportunity to obtain higher education because they, ha they had my brother when they were still in high school and I came shortly after. I had a goal to go to school and graduate, then move on to college, and the climate of the school made my four years in the high school a uh, tumultuous ride. What I often remember about high school was how fortunate I was to have a good relationship with my guidance counselor and how much it helped my school career. The conversations we had always provided clarity when I was going through stuff at home and when I had questions about the college application process. I knew that she was always someone I could sit down with and make sense out of any situation I was dealing with. The only problem was the ratio of guidance counselors to students in my school did not allow her to be accessible often. We only had one guidance counselor for hundreds of students in my school that she was responsible for helping. However, on any given day, there was always at least 20 school safety agents at the front desk at scanning or roaming the building. There are twice as many police officers in school as there are guidance counselors. What does that tell? What does that tell us about how people think about us, about our future? School safety agents served as agitators with the sole purpose of making that my day worse. And as a student, I felt that the day-to-day -day harassment and zero tolerance policies in place created an atmosphere of criminalization and caused self-doubt amongst students. Circumstances like this should never exist in any setting, and I appreciate the fact that we are here to talk about it, but understand that more needs to be done besides talking about the issues. I am here to say I am here to, to I am here today to say that we do not need cops or safety agents in our schools because they do not keep us safe. Instead, we are calling for more guidance counselors, mental health services, and restorative justice practices that will create an environment in schools that help us be successful. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Onyx Walker, and I'm a youth organizer at Future of Tomorrow and the Urban Youth Collaborative. 
Um, last month, the Urban Youth Collaborative released a report around strategies to ensure that our schools are safe and supportive, supported by evidence-based priorities. The report pulls from 20 years of experiences of young people in our organizations attending New York City public schools and research analyzing school safety and discipline. After decades of increasing police presence in schools and the criminalization of black and Latinx youth, there is no conclusive evidence police officers and dehumanizing security measures, including metal detectors and or scanning, are effective in making our schools any safer. In fact, there is evidence that says the opposite. School policing disproportionately harms black, Latinx, LGBTQ, and students with disabilities, turning minor youthful behavior into crimes. In relation to that, in NYC, black and Latinx students make up 67% of the student body, yet account for 92% of all arrests, 89% of summons, and 88% of all juvenile reports in schools. 78% of all arrests, summons, and juvenile reports are for misdemeanors and or violations. When schools have police officers, students are more likely to be funneled into the criminal justice system for minor offenses and mental health issues. Criminalizing students of color through policing normal youthful behavior and invasive safety measures are barriers to creating truly safe, supportive, and nurturing learning environments. Students are not going to look for support to resolve conflict or share their issues when they can't find a guidance counselor and are handcuffed and arrested for mental health and emotional issues. The school safety division employs 5,500 personnel, while we only have 2,800 full-time guidance counselors. There is one guidance counselor for every 407 students and one school safety agent for every 207 students. What does it say about our priorities when studies show increasing the number of guidance counselors is linked with a reduction in incidents of fighting and bullying, but we're not hearing anyone commit to the increasing number of guidance counselors and reducing the role of police officers in school discipline? We don't need police officers getting involved in more school discipline issues. We need to significantly increase the number of guidance counselors so it's one for every 100 students in, in high, high need schools. And immediately revise the MOU with the NYPD and DOE to ensure students see guidance counselors and social workers and not police officers and judges for school discipline issues. Guidance counselors and social workers are key to creating supportive and nurturing learning environments, as well as other key priorities, fully implementing restorative justice, a mental health network, and creating safe spaces through culturally re relevant education. The Department of Education has increased funding for restorative justice, but we spend $400 million on policing students and $10 million for restorative justice. This is another example of misplaced priorities. Schools fully invested in embracing restorative justice have seen a reduction in suspensions, reductions in discipline incidents, and an improvement in school climate and academic outcomes. Restorative justice will move us away from punishment and alienation and move the city towards a more just and fair approach that keeps young people close to a supportive community. Just as we have learned that mass incar incarceration and broken windows does nothing to create safer communities, we have learned that similar approaches to discipline in schools does nothing to create safer schools. Young people are in a unique position to provide solutions for creating truly safe and supportive schools, but we need people to believe in us and let us lead the way. Embedding police further into discipline issues will only push the city far away from criminal justice reform. Divesting from policing, including police officers in schools and metal detectors, and arrests and summons and reallocating those funds for the social, emotional, and mental health needs of young people is not only more effective, it is just and shows the city is invested in the future of all young people. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Gibson. My name is Kate Terenzi, and I work at the Center for Popular Democracy. The Center for Popular Democracy is a national organization, and our education justi justice campaign works in collaboration and solidarity with our partners and allies across the country, including the Urban Youth Collaborative, to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline. Today's hearing asks the question, what is the New York Police Department's role in improving school climate? The answer, supported by the evidence, is that there is no role for them in schools. Proponents of school policing and punitive disciplinary action often cite student safety as their primary justification for infusing schools with police officers. Yet research has found that there is no substantial support for the proposition that police presence in schools creates safer learning environments. To the contrary, several studies have shown that young people are no safer after years of punitive practices. Research illustrates that policing in schools does not reduce incidents of bullying or fighting, and young people feel significantly less safe. These practices also push young people out of the very schools they're intended to learn from. In addition to being ineffective, 
Policing in New York City schools create extreme racial disparities, as you've heard about. Black girls are 14.4 times more likely to be arrested than white girls. 97% of the young people, middle school age or younger, who are arrested last year are black and Latinx, compared to their share of the population at just 67%. These disparities are seen despite evidence that young people from different races do not misbehave at significantly different rates. Our schools can and must move away from policies and practices that are ineffective and criminalize young people. There are three immediate steps the City Council should make to move away from racist and ineffective policies. The first is to support the calls of these young people through the end of, by calling for the end of arrests and summonses, juvenile reports in schools for misdemeanors and violations. The second, institute a moratorium on the installation of any new metal detectors and remove all currently installed machines. And three, invest deeply in transformative practices that have been proven to provide truly safe schools, including restorative practices, comprehensive mental health care, and significantly more guidance counselors and social workers. The Urban Youth Collaborative and the Center for Popular Democracy released the, a policy brief, The Young People's Vision for Safe and Supportive Schools, which we will submit with our written testimony. Each of the solutions included there is supported not only by the experiences of young people, which should be guiding all of our thought, but also extensive academic studies. The City Council has the opportunity through the budget cycle to deeply invest in this youth-driven and research-backed solutions. Young people have long known the types of support they need to learn and thrive in their schools. The research proves that their solutions work. The city must head, heed these calls and implement these practices in a transformational citywide way. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Gibson. My name is Roberto Cabanas, and I'm the coordinator for the Urban Youth Collaborative. Um, I have a brief statement and also here to uh, submit our policy brief for the record. Um, the city must stop criminalizing normal youthful behavior. Um, the school is a place for young people to make mistakes. 78% um, of all arrests, summonses, and juvenile reports are for misdemeanors and violations. Young people will continue to suffer at the hands of ineffective and racist practices so long as we rely on police rather than supporting systems to create safer and supportive school communities. The city must be bold enough to reimagine safety so that, is it, so that it's rooted in effective and humane practices of support rather than policing. And so in our conversations and meeting with young people, and we meet with young people all across the city, they are the best people uh, and the best resource to come up with policy to create those safe and supportive schools that we all desire for every child um, in the city. And we ask that you consider uh, reading our uh, policy recommendations um, because they came directly from the young people themselves. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I won't be able to have more of a conversation with all of you simply because I have more panels behind you. Um, but truly, I thank you, Urban Youth Collaborative, um, Center for Democracy. We've worked together on many, many occasions, and I appreciate the opportunity to always hear from young people. Um, I am not that far removed from being young uh, that I do not listen to our young people because you really are living the work that we do every day, and certainly we appreciate the opportunity that you came here today um, to testify before the committee. So I really, really thank you for your efforts. I encourage you to continue to work with us so that we can continue to demonstrate our support through policy changes and through money. Um, I think the restorative justice work that we've done and putting more money into schools for mental health and guidance counselors and social workers, school-based health centers really is our commitment to everything that you're talking about. But I do recognize we have to continue to push. We cannot accept everything that we have now as being perfect, but we honestly have to continue to push the needle. So I appreciate your presence today and look forward to our continued work together. Thank you for being here today. Okay. This one? Okay. Our next panel is Nelson Marr from Bronx Legal Services, Karen Frokas from Brooklyn Defender Services, 
Nancy Ginsburg and Kara Chambers from the Legal Aid Society, Joanna Miller from NICLU, the New York Civil Liberties Union, and Gian Faro from the New York Civil Liberties Union, New York Law School. Yes, you can start. You may begin. Thank you for being here today. Is the button on? Good afternoon. Oh, okay, much. My name is Jan Falvo, and I'm a third year law student at New York Law School, and I am part of the law school's legislative advocacy clinic working in conjunction with the New York Civil Liberties Union. Today, I speak on behalf of myself and my colleagues in the clinic about the school to prison pipeline and its detrimental effects on our city students. Due to the presence of law enforcement in public schools, minor behavioral infractions too often result in suspension, expulsion, arrest, or incarceration of the students involved. School discipline policies that rely on law enforcement and out of school suspensions increase the number of young people exposed to the criminal justice system at risk of incarceration. Research shows that young people who have contact with police are significantly less likely to complete secondary school, experience less human capital development, and diminish earning potentials, and are more likely to be incarcerated as adults. In New York City, we have the largest school police force in the nation, so more of our children are at risk than anywhere else in the country. The U.S. incarceration rate has increased 700% since 1970. This increase is disproportionately due to the incarceration of black and Latino people. In the U.S., black people make up only 12% of the total population, yet they make up 38% of the prison population. Likewise, Latino Americans make up 17% of the total U.S. population and 17% of the prison population. One of the main causes of this disparity is the impact of the zero-tolerance disciplinary policies employed by the nation's schools. Students of color are suspended and arrested at a rate more than two times greater than white students for the same offenses. Suspension, expulsion, and arrest are often the first steps in a chain of events that lead to academic disengagement and trouble with the law. Over the past several years, several school districts in the U.S. have had positive outcomes as a result of replacing zero-tolerance policies with restorative justice policies. After eliminating zero-tolerance policies for petty acts and misdemeanors and adopting restorative justice policies, Broward County Public School District, the sixth largest school district in the U.S., and Miami-Dade County Public School District, the fourth largest district in the U.S., dramatically increased graduation rates and decreased arrests and suspensions. In 2009, Florida amended its zero-tolerance statute and gave school districts the option of softening their disciplinary policies. As a result, Broward County and Miami-Dade decided to adopt restorative justice disciplinary policies for petty acts of misconduct and misdemeanors. The students of the Legislative Advocacy Clinic provide the following recommendations to be considered to address this issue. Provide comprehensive guidelines for SRO interactions with students through establishing limits on law enforcement activities in schools and promoting a student bill of rights. Limit police presence in schools and empower educators to respond to disruption and misbehavior in a way that contributes to students' educational progress. The City Council can promote this through allocating funding for positive discipline alternatives and reducing funding for the school safety officers. Reduce the number of young people subjected to criminal justice penalties because of in-school misbehavior. The City Council can help accomplish this by using its oversight power to promote the adoption of the NY of a renewed memorandum of understanding between the DOE and the NYPD that limits students' exposure to criminal penalties and audit the DOE and NYPD's performance in reducing criminal justice penalties by reviewing data and exercising oversight authority. New York City can and should follow in Miami's footsteps and begin to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline, robbing so many of the city's youth of their chance at a positive educational experience. New York City can set an example for the rest of the country to stop these practices. In turn, the city will reap the benefits of a better educated and more empowered population for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'm Kara Chambers. I'm here with my colleague Nancy Ginsburg. We submit this testimony on behalf of the Legal Aid Society, and we thank Chairperson Gibson and the Committee on Public Safety for inviting our thoughts on issues of school climate and the role of NYPD school safety in New York City's public schools. We urge the Council and the Administration to resist pressure to respond to the troubling violence in our schools by increasing the number of metal detectors and law enforcement personnel in schools. While metal detectors certainly do screen out dangerous instruments and weapons brought to school, they don't address the underlying reasons that students feel the need to bring those weapons to school. Failure to address conflicts among students leads them to take matters into their own hands, either inside or outside the school building. In our experience, metal detectors are flashpoints for conflict between students and adults in schools. It can be a particularly difficult experience for students with special needs, mental health issues, and trauma histories, and can create a negative school environment. While we recognize that metal detectors may be justified in schools with historically high rates of weapons recovery, there should be clear guidelines on the placement and removal of metal detectors in schools to provide transparency in the process for students and families and an opportunity for review and assessment. The same recommendation regarding the need for clear guidelines on the placement and removal of metal, metal detectors was made by the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline. The NYPD testified today that they have developed protocols for the installation and removal of metal detectors in schools. It's unclear to us, however, whether those protocols have been adequately promulgated and whether the Department of Education has truly begun to follow them yet. In addition to examining policies related to the placement and removal of metal detectors in schools, the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline also looked carefully at the role of school safety agents, precinct officers, and, educations, and educators in maintaining school safety and discipline. The leadership team concluded that the existing memorandum of understanding between the NYPD and the Department of Education, which was drafted in 1998, is outdated and does not adequately delineate the respective roles of NYPD and DOE staff in responding to student conduct. We strongly endorse the leadership team's recommendation that the MOU be revised. A revised MOU would place primary, primary, has to place primary responsibility for maintaining positive school climate on educators, not police, should limit law enforcement involvement in minor student misconduct, set forth protocols for handcuffing and searches, clarify responsibilities for parent notification after restraint summonses and arrests, and establish mandatory training requirements for school safety agents. We hope the NYPD and DOE will continue to work with the leadership team and other key stakeholders to draft a document that will provide meaningful guidance to school personnel and law enforcement. Raising issues of over-reliance on metal detectors and law enforcement personnel in schools does not dilute our concerns about violence in New York City schools. On the contrary, we share the distress of the New York City community on these issues. Our concern primarily is that the only meaningful response to this crisis is that it needs to be, it, there, there needs to be more comprehensive, funded, integrated services that will address the underlying causes of the violence. Um, one of the working groups uh, that was part of the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline focused on coordinating the delivery of mental health services in, in the highest need schools with many of the highest need students. Mental health professionals are best poised to improve the prevention um, and of and response to challenging and disruptive behaviors in schools because of their training and their focus on the social and emotional well-being of children, youth, and families. We encourage the DOE and other city agencies to reevaluate and implement the recommendations of the leadership team to improve mental health delivery to our city's school children. We also um, encourage both agencies, the NYPD and the Department of Education, to follow the leadership team's recommendations regarding comprehensive strategies to address the needs of students who exhibit challenging behaviors. The School Safety Division of the NYPD has actually dedicated a significant portion of its training budget to teach collaborative problem solving and de-escalation techniques. We have observed a significant impact from this training. There's been a drastic reduction in conflict between students and school safety agents, both verbal and physical. Unfortunately, the Department of Education has not engaged in similar efforts to train their staff and provide comprehensive um, instruction on collaborative problem solving and de-escalation techniques. We would encourage the Department of Education to mandate similar training for all of its staff. It cannot be optional. This is a 
pervasive problem. It requires a comprehensive response uh, that is consistent among all adults, adults in the building, both NYPD and school staff. And without adequate training, the DOE school staff cannot be expected to respond appropriately. In sum, increasing the law enforcement presence and use of metal detectors as the sole responses to violence in schools is akin to putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone. Instead, New York City must build a meaningful continuum of mental health care to help support students, families, and schools. The city has to commit and to pay for and support those practices that have demonstrated success if we truly expect communities to heal. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. My name is Karen Farkas. I am the supervising attorney in BDS, Brooklyn Defender Services Education Unit. BDS shares the council's deep commitment to supporting positive school climates and decreasing and increasing school safety. While we appreciate the New York Police Department's efforts to train school safety agents in mental health first aid and de-escalation techniques, we firmly believe that even the most well-intentioned, well-trained, school safety agent or police officer is ill-equipped to positively address student misbehavior. Why are we investing in training school safety agents to be more like educators and trained mental health clinicians, especially when studies show that a police present in school can actually decrease a student's perceptions of safety and lead, themselves, lead them to make unsafe, unsafe choices to protect themselves? Likewise, a strong law enforcement presence can set a tone of distrust in a school that is not conducive to learning and is linked to poor academic achievement and school disengagement. Our clients' experiences mirror this data. We regularly meet with young people grappling with the harmful cumulative impact of punitive discipline and police interaction at school. These repeated experiences, often for nonviolent adolescent misbehavior, have damaged not only their attitude towards school, but their attitudes about themselves and their potential. Young people can sense when they are no longer wanted in a school community. One way our clients repeated, repeatedly hear that message is when, instead of responding to adolescent misbehavior with trained mental health clinicians and evidence-based approaches premised on reconciliation, relationship building, and conversations to address the impact of their behavior, law enforcement takes the lead. When our kindergarten and first grade clients with known behavioral needs tantrum and they are restrained by police or school safety agents, they get a message we do not want to send. When our teenage clients test boundaries and authority, act impulsively, and escalate typical peer conflict, and no caring staff member sits with them in earnest to have a conversation and give them the opportunity to confront their behavior, make amends, and take responsibility, they get a message we do not want to send. We also lose the opportunity to instill these young people with the problem-solving and coping skills needed to lead productive lives. Many of our clients have experienced trauma or poverty that has also complicated their development. Some also have emotional disabilities. Using punitive or law enforcement responses rather than positive, preventative, restorative approaches, we not only fail to get at the root of behaviors, we risk exacerbating the underlying behavioral and circumstantial challenges. We know that this risk is real from our clients. An Advocates for Children's recent report that nearly 29% of incidents where police or safety agents are called are for children in crisis experiencing emotional distress. This is not only inappropriate and harmful, but, it's dis but it displays the disparate impact on students of color. In short, we need to foster a school culture that presumptively approaches all student misbehavior as teach teachable moments. To do so, there needs to be a financial shift away from law enforcement in schools and a strong investment in resources that can actually help educators identify issues early and teach young people conflict, re conflict resolution, emotional regulation, and critical thinking, which they can draw upon in the future. We need to follow the roadmap developed by the mayoral leadership team on school climate and discipline, and instill resources in school-based and school-linked mental health services, expand our investment in whole school approaches to positive behavior, such as collaborative problem solving, restorative practices, and TCIS, and increase school-based staff with the training and time to oversee implementation of these approaches and ensure access to ongoing coaching, such as trained guidance counselors, 
licensed social workers, and restorative justice coordinators. These are the investments our students deserve that will improve school climate. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Gibson. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you here today. Um, my name is Nelson Marr. Um, I'm an attorney at Bronx Legal Services. I'm here to give testimony on behalf of um, Bronx Legal Services. Um, in, in the course of um, our work in the Bronx um, on education issues over these years, it's, it's become very clear that um, there has been a significant sea change in um, how schools are functioning uh, with regards to public, uh, with school safety agents. Um, when I first started, uh, school safety agents um, definitely were, were a bigger part of the problem, and now they're, they've moved towards being part of the solution. And, and this sort of reflects the ongoing tension um, in many of the communities that I work in uh, around policing. And school safety has the unenviable task of trying to balance um, their responsibilities to ensure safety um, and sometimes being called to pull in to maintain order. And, and I think that that underlies the bigger issues here. Um, in order for us to really move forward on improving um, school climate, uh, just passing these, um, these uh, approaches and, and edicts without really resources is going to undermine these efforts. Um, we, we are at a, at, a, at a pivotal point here where there is this amazing commitment and, um, and, and the Deputy Director Brian Conroy should be applauded for all the efforts that he's taken um, to try to improve uh, the training among school safety agents. But in order for, for us to move further, um, there needs to be more resources. And, and I echo everything that's been said so far by both uh, my colleagues here at this table and also by the students and, and youth organizers before me that um, there needs to be more resources. And, and part of the reason why school safety has been put in this position for so long is because the schools oftentimes did not have any other tools in their toolbox. They couldn't go to um, a, a mental health person on, on their team, so instead they called the school safety agent to restrain a child when the child was having a crisis. And I think if, if the city can commit to providing resources, both in terms of training, whether it be restorative practices, but also in terms of services, actually uh, providing uh, capital resources in, in terms of um, individuals like guidance counselors, social workers, and mental health providers, then we would see um, a greater shift and an, an improved school climate without relying on um, school safety. Uh, there is an additional issue with regards to data. Um, that I did want to bring up. Um, I think that the city has come a long way, again, in terms of um, transparency with regards to data, and, and that was through uh, significant efforts from um, yourself, Chairperson uh, Gibson, in terms of passing the amendments to the Student Safety Act. However, um, it, it appears that more needs to be done. Um, specifically, there needs to be greater coordination between um, the data that's being issued by the NYPD and the DOE. Um, from our analysis of, of some of that data, there seems to be inconsistencies, and we would encourage that there be efforts taken to, to address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I know it's been a long morning, so I'll be really quick. My name is Joanna Miller. I'm the Director of Advocacy at the New York Civil Liberties Union. I just want to make three points today. Um, the first one, as you correctly pointed out, 100,000 or maybe a little more than 100,000 New York City public school students walk through a metal detector every day. And as you pointed out, more than 90% of those students are black and Latino. We cannot stand by and let the DOE and the NYPD get away with this unbelievably racially biased use of this tool. If you just break it down, let's just say for argument's sake that there's 90,000 black and Latino young people who spend four or maybe seven years of their life 
standing in line for a metal detector every single day, it's mind boggling. The effect, the impact of that on their school climate, their experience of the educational environment and their sense of belonging in our city is so beyond being able to describe in this room. I'm sure that the young people here would be more than happy to take you to wait in the line with them. I think it would be very valuable for members of the council. I think you probably have done this already. But for other members of the council, members of the, the DOE executive and administrative staff, to actually go stand in that line when it's 30 degrees outside and kids are taking their shoes off and standing or wrapped around a building for an hour. And then to go in and be told, oh, you have to go back through because you have hairpins. Or you have to go back through because you have um, you brought silverware in your lunchbox. I mean, that kind of stuff happens every day, and the, the demoralization of it is so enormous, it's really quite offensive for the NYPD and the DOE to minimize that and for other people to minimize that and say, oh, we walk through metal detectors all the time. That is not the case here. This metal detector, you fly through it. That's not what's happening at these high schools. I think it's really, really important that we think about the hugely disproportionate impact there. The second thing I just want to raise is I think their city council has a role to play in breaking down the false dichotomy that's presented by the DOE and the NYPD on these issues. The fact that the DOE insists that school safety is not their responsibility doesn't mean that the city council has to buy into that. School safety, school climate, the whole kit and caboodle is the responsibility of the DOE. They have paid money to bring in the NYPD. That's a tool in their toolbox. But we cannot be pushing these responsibilities off on the NYPD. And as was remarked by several of my colleagues here, the NYPD is actually leaps and bounds ahead of the DOE, which is a shame. That's, it's shameful. So why, I'm just going to copy from Kara, because she said it so beautifully, why are we training cops to act more like educators when we could be investing more in our educators? We should be putting that money into the restorative practices it doesn't matter how much you train a cop, there's still going to be a cop. So we need to move away from that. And I think the city council has an important role to play in breaking down that dichotomy and, frankly, forcing the DOE and the NYPD to solve these problems together and to come before you together and talk about them. It was heartening to see the DOE was here today and working with the NYPD, but so, so much more needs to be done in that regard. The third thing I just want to raise is about the standards for the use of metal detectors. We cannot add one new metal detector into this system until we find out more about how they are doing, making decisions about metal detectors. So the chief, and I give him a lot of credit, he's done a lot of good work in this area, but he very vaguely alluded to these standards about when they would add a metal detector and when they would take them away. But frankly, even educators don't understand what those standards are. As far as we know from participation in the mayor's leadership team, there is no standard for when they decide to take something out or put something in. There's no mathematical formula, there's no review process, there's no committee that makes that decision. Secondly, there's no standard for how the metal detectors are constructed or, uh, or how they're set, the sensitivity level for the metal detector. So one building to another, the, the experience is completely different, which is why you hear from young people that they're getting stopped for hairpins, which is frankly absurd. So, they're not using this tool to the effect that they claim to be. They're not even using it in a standardized way across the city. The third thing is there's no ongoing or consistent training whatsoever for either school personnel or cops on how to use these things. They put them in and then they walk away. And if the thing is not working, nobody knows. There's nobody in the school who would know that this machine is malfunctioning. So putting our trust in that machine to maintain the sanctity of the school environment is frankly even more inane than putting our trust in a bunch of cops to maintain the sanctity of the school environment. Neither of those tools is going to do this job. Those tools need to be used in minimal emergency basis when there's a really compelling reason, and then they need to go. And right now, we're not setting up any structure that allows the DOE to reduce that reliance. We're setting up a structure where they increase, increase, increase reliance. So I think the council has a really important role to play on the oversight, um, on your oversight power there too, particularly where the, DOE, where the NYPD says there's certain information they can't re reveal publicly. They actually could reveal that to you privately if there is a compelling safety reason why it can't be revealed. That's the kind of thing that the city council could be working with them on and finding out more. How is this impacting, um, how is this impacting kids? And making sure that they're not hiding behind a safety exception when what they really don't want to tell you is that police officers are concentrated in the schools that have the least resources and the least support from the DOE. So with that, I will stop. I know there's lots of other people who need to testify, but thank you so much for your focus on this issue. Absolutely. Thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thank you.
Our next panel is Ashley Sawyer from Youth Represent, Khadija Hudson from Girls for Gender Equity, Dawn Euster from Advocates for Children of New York, Brittany Brathwaite from Girls for Gender Equity, and Charlotte Pope from Children's Defense Fund of New York. Okay, you may begin. Thank, Thank you, Chairperson Gibson. My name is Ashley Sawyer. I'm an attorney at Youth Represent, where we provide holistic legal representation to young people ages 16 to 24 who've had contact with the criminal system, including in school suspensions, which is often the first step into the school to prison pipeline. For many of my clients, their first contact with the criminal legal system came from their experiences with school safety officers. In fact, some of the young people that I've worked with, their decisions to drop out of school altogether came from altercations with school safety agents. They are often the entry point into the criminal legal system. As an attorney providing support for youth in New York City schools, I've seen CS school safety agents with my own eyes yell at, berate, and curse out students all before 9 a.m. just for not going through the morning metal detector routine correctly. For many students, SSAs represent the criminalization of their academic experience, and the presence of school police increases the likelihood that a student will have juvenile, a juvenile or criminal record and increases the dropout rate. So I want to share the story with you of a young person. I'm going to call her Rita. She's my client. Rita is black, masculine presenting, queer teenage girl who currently attends a New York City public school. Like many other youth of color, particularly queer youth and gender non-conforming youth, her interactions with school safety agents have been tense, degrading, and sometimes violent. In a very recent incident, just last month, Rita was grabbed by a male school safety agent, thrown to the cement ground, and pinned down by five additional school safety agents. The school safety agents made no attempts to de-escalate the situation, no attempts to talk rationally or kindly with Rita. They instead used physical brutality to subdue the 17-year-old girl. Rita is short in stature and could have easily been seriously injured by their behavior. I cannot imagine a scenario in which it would be appropriate to use this level of force on a teenage girl, particularly holding her down as five adults tried to control her body. The deprivation of human dignity, the rash use of force, all stem from Rita using foul language towards a school staff member and playing basketball in a neighborhood school. The deprivation of Rita's bodily autonomy is unacceptable and should be intolerable in any safe, supportive school climate. It is also emblematic of a larger problem with the presence of school safety agents. I've heard the, ref the expression in reference to school-based police, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If there was an infraction, Rita's behavior could have been handled by an adult civilian staff member, but because they have SSAs at their disposal, they use them instead of looking for other solutions. In a system where there are five finite resources, restorative practices, and school-based mental health should be prioritized over law enforcement, and we should reframe our conversation to ensure that we are not drawing a false equivalence between school safety and the presence of metal detectors and police. We often hear that quality interventions like restorative justice and mental health support are expensive, but if we divest resources away from law enforcement, our children can thrive. The research shows that police presence increases the likelihood that our youth will have contact with criminal systems. You heard folks from CPD and Urban Youth Collaborative share that we have 5,000 New York Police Department personnel in schools, 113 patrol officers, compared to just 2,800 school-based counselors. School-based mental health services can encompass a broad away array of preventative interventions, assessments, counseling, referrals to community programs, and special education services where needed. The resources we often invest toward training school safety agents to respond to crises, including bullying and interpersonal conflict, could be better spent training educators and school professionals. School climate can be enhanced by investing resources in doing what works and what is backed by evidence, in particular school-based mental health services. 
services. What Rita suffered is appalling. I watched the video of what happened, and it is only indicative of what happens when schools begin to rely on law enforcement for safety instead of looking at what ways we can be providing support for our students. I want to echo the remarks of CPD, Make the Road Urban Youth Collaborative, and encourage that we divest from school safety agents, agents, metal detectors, and other tools of criminalization. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Euster, and I am the director of the School Justice Project at Advocates for Children of New York, AFC. AFC School Justice Project advocates for families with students facing emotional and behavioral challenges, school discipline, or court involvement to help these students get the support they need to succeed in school. AFC serves hundreds of students each year who come in contact with law enforcement officials in their schools. Based on AFC's experiences and NYPD data, a substantial portion of what the NYPD does in schools falls outside of law enforcement. Of the reported 9,385 interventions by school safety agents and police officers during the 2016 to 17 school year, 40% were so-called mitigations, incidents where the NYPD became involved and then released the student to the school for discipline without taking further police action. Mostly students of color are the subject of NYPD mitigations. About 95% of these interventions involve students of color. Moreover, 61% were black students, even though black students made up only about 27% of overall student enrollment. Earlier this month, AFC released a data brief showing that 28.8% of all police interventions in schools for the 2016 to 17 school year were what the NYPD calls child in crisis interventions, incidents where the police became involved when a student displayed signs of emotional distress and was then taken to the hospital for psychiatric evaluation. Nearly half of these interventions involved children 12 years old or younger. Here, too, we see, we see startling overrepresentation of children of color. About 95% of child and crisis interventions by police and schools involved students of color. Half were black students, again, vastly disproportional to their 27% share of the student population. The scope of law enforcement's role as de facto mental health responders in school is likely much larger. For example, this reported data fails to capture the students in emotional distress where the NYPD responded and then made an arrest or issued a summons or juvenile report. It is not that white children never experience episodes of emotional distress or that they are never involved in dis disciplinary incidents requiring adult intervention, but their conspicuous scarcity in the NYPD's reporting suggests that when these situations do involve white students, they are more often addressed by someone other than police. This disparity matters. Contacts with law enforcement often have a negative impact on individual children directly involved as well as the overall school climate. In particular, students who are handcuffed during police interactions may suffer lasting effects from trauma. About 61.8% of children handcuffed during child and crisis interventions were black, and 100% of children 12 and under who were handcuffed during this type of intervention were students of color. Likewise, not one of the 73 students handcuffed during mitigations were white. Law enforcement's mission creep into matters of mental health and school discipline is cause for serious concern, and that this overreach and its impact primarily affect New York City's children of color is cause for Im immediate reform. Mental health professionals with appropriate training and skills are best positioned to assess and address the needs of students in emotional distress. School staff with appropriate training, resources, and support are best positioned to prevent and de-escalate incidents that might otherwise lead to police intervention. Law enforcement plays an important and irreplaceable role in keeping our city, including its children, safe. But in matters of school discipline and student mental health, New York City should unambiguously place responsibility in the hands of the professionals whose lives and careers are centered on supporting the growth and well-being of the young people in their charge. We recommend that the city collaborate with the administration to realign city resources to reflect the critical need to appropriately support students' social-emotional needs and address the striking racial disparities in police interventions. As an initial step, the city council should work with the mayor to fund a mental health services network in 20 high-need schools. 
This mental health continuum pilot program, recommended by the mayor's leadership team on school climate and discipline, would include school partnerships with hospital-based mental health clinics, call-in centers to assist schools with students in crisis, mobile response teams, school-based uh, behavioral health consultants to help students get direct mental health services, collaborative problem solving, and program evaluation. Second, and I'm almost done, the City Council should work with the administration to invest in a long-term plan with necessary funding to develop and expand school-wide and district-wide positive, inclusive, and supportive approaches to address student behaviors and improve school climate. Research shows, as you know, that positive evidence-based alternatives to policing students in school, such as restorative practices, collaborative problem solving, and trauma-informed approaches, support schools in building the skills and capacities of students and adults to constructively resolve conflict and de-escalate behavior. Third and finally, the City Council should urge the NYPD and the Department of Education to enter an information sharing agreement that comports with privacy laws in order for the NYPD to publicly report data disaggregated by whether the student is receiving special education services. Reporting this data by disability status is required by the Student Safety Act amendments and will allow changes where they are desperately needed. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, we look forward to working with you, the City Council, the administration as the budget process moves forward. Next, you may begin. Okay. Good afternoon, Council Member Gibson. My name is Khadija Hudson, and I'm a community organizer at Girls for Gender Equity. Girls for Gender Equity is an intergenerational organization committed to the advocacy and development of girls and women. Through education and organizing, GGE encourages communities to remove barriers and create opportunities for girls and women to live self-determined lives. As an organization, we are also active members in the Dignity in Schools campaign. Thank you for convening this hearing on the NYPD school safety agent's role and efforts to improve school climate in New York City schools. Girls for Gender Equity has been at the forefront of community-led initiatives working alongside young people to highlight racial and gender barriers and improving school climate. Our collaboration with young people has indicated that the presence and role of NYPD school safety agents foster in school foster an environment that makes them feel unsafe and criminalized. In 2016, we conducted participatory action research with over 100 New York City girls and transgender and gender nonconforming young people who attend school. In this research, young people overwhelming, overwhelmingly express negative and oppressive experiences with NYPD school safety agents. A young person in our study stated, we have safety agents everywhere in the building and it makes me feel like a prisoner. Other young people in our study have expressed similar sen sentiments. In New York City public schools, there are 5,200 NYPD school safety agents, but only 2,850 social workers and 1,193 guidance counselors in all New York City public schools. The large presence of NYPD school safety agents in New York City public schools are not an indicator of safety. In our study, young people still experience various forms of violence in their school, despite the high number of school safety agents. This is because NYPD school safety agents do not actually create safer school environments. Historically, the presence of police, including school safety agents, in communities of color create more hostile environments. Research from the African American Policy Forum states that the presence of school safety agents in New York City has led to daily exchange and interactions with law enforcement and greatly expanded the surveillance of, young, of youth of color and the normalization of prison culture in school settings. NYPD school safety agents recreate the harsh policing and surveillance practices that police officers do in communities of color inside of schools. In our report, the school girls deserve youth-driven solutions for creating safe, holistic, and affirming New York City public schools. Youth express a strong desire for a complete removal of all police from public schools. This recommendation is consistent with findings from other young people surveyed across New York City and in other states, including New York City advocates such as Dignity in Schools Campaign New York and the Urban Youth Collaborative, which recommend that school safety agents be removed from all schools and funding be redirected to counselors, social workers, and restorative justice programming. NYPD school safety agents are not beneficial to the learning or safety of young people in New York City public schools. 
Young people deserve to go to a school where they do not feel like criminals, but rather feel safe and affirmed so that they may thrive. I encourage you to collaborate with young people to create the best learning environments for them that keeps them safe, but does not criminalize them, and work to remove school safety agents from all New York City public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Gibson. My name is Brittany Brathwaite. I am a senior organizer at Girls for Gender Equity, and I'll be reading testimony on behalf of a young person, Christina Powell, who I work with, who is in school right now. I'll also submit her written testimony for the record. Hi, my name is Christina, and I am 17 years old. My pronouns are she, her, her, and hers. I am a sister and strength youth organizer and a member of the Young Women's Advisory Council at Girls for Gender Equity. One way we do this, one way we fight for the schools that girls deserve is by highlighting the problem of school pushout and presenting the visions of schools that we want. School pushout is when a young person is forced out of school because of several reasons that are rooted in racism, sexism, Islamophobia, homophobia, and transphobia. Some of the manifestations of school pushout are harsh, dis harsh discipline codes, dress codes, metal detectors, and absence from school curriculum. Most students that experience school pushout are black and Latinx. Here's my personal story. Every day I have to go through a metal detector in order to enter my school. There are times in which I have to make multiple trips through the metal detector because I have on too much metal, like a bracelet or a necklace, and it's made me late for class. According to a participatory action research project, Girls for Gender Equity performed and did on how girls and transgender youth of color experience school pushout, nearly half of the girls of color had experience going through a metal detector. Every once in a while, my school invites other police officers from surrounding precincts into the school to perform scanning. On these days, when I'm on my way to school, I'm approached, one day I was approached by a police officer and he asked me to take off my coat, put it in my bag, and then sent me to the lunchroom. Then another police officer put, told me to put my hands up so that she could scan me. And then another officer told me to put my hands on a table and raise my foot so that they could check my feet. Do I look like I'm trying to hide something in my feet? It's like they're trying to find an excuse to arrest me or persecute me. I believe in my own opinion that it is unfair because if, even if I didn't do anything, they are criminalizing me. Kids come to school to learn, not to be scanned. Kids come to school to learn, to get an education. Kids want to be safe and not criminalized. Instead of policing us when conflicts or fight happens, we should be able to have conversations without offending each other and ending, up, and ending it on a good note. I want to eliminate metal detectors because they do, they do more harm than good. And if you say that you're protecting me, I feel that you're pushing me out of school and making me feel like a criminal. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Charlotte Pope, and I'm the Youth Justice Policy Associate at the Children's Defense Fund New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. In our work, we understand that police responses to student behavior in school fall short in preventing conflict and harm from happening, disrupt students' engagement in school, and do not provide the structure or support that influence students' feelings of safety. We urge the city to shift policy and resources towards positive, affirming approaches by expanding restorative practices with the ultimate goal of citywide implementation and increasing mental health supports and the number of full-time guidance counselors and social workers. While we support the goal of reducing potential student contact with court through the warning card program, this tool must be available to all schools for all behavior and must not be subject to individual student safety agent discretion. To take a step further with our Dignity in Schools campaign partners, we're calling on the city to end the use of summonses in school and instead prioritize meaningful school-led accountability processes. While most pieces of the Student Safety Act data are alarming, including the reliance on patrol officers, it does show that most schools in New York City handle behaviors without resorting to police intervention. And it is a small number of school campuses that are in need of support. We know that police intervention patterns are less a result of student behavior than a result in the adult response. We know that school staff train to ensure safe and positive school climates, such as a community intervention workers, peace builders, and transformative or restorative justice coordinators can and do prevent and address safety concerns, harm, and conflicts. I also have a comment from a student advocate who could not be here today who had this to add. Starting my freshman year of high school, I attended a school that had metal detectors, but the school that I currently attend does not. 
I feel free. I don't have to worry about stepping to the side and getting searched and patted down every day. I don't have to feel uncomfortable and like my personal space is being violated. I don't have to feel dehumanized. When I think about what my first school didn't have, they didn't have a sense of unity. Students at my current school support one another in everything, and it's a safe space. We live in a world where there are limited expectations for certain students at certain schools. Where I am now, we talk about needs and we understand each other's struggles. We are a family. Safety means talking with students about what they really need, helping people be aware of one another, and supporting one another to be unafraid of being who they are. Thank you again. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming today. We really appreciate your support and your input and all that you're doing to make our schools safe. Thank you so much. I also want to recognize that we have testimony submitted for the record from the UFT, the United Federation of Teachers, in regards to today's hearing. As this hearing comes to a close, let me thank my